Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, May 12th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. Today, we have a lot on our plate. We are going to uh, finalize all the committee report outs for the FY24 operating budgets and CIP budgets. And first on the agenda is the budget for Montgomery College. And I will turn it over to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, Chair Jawanda. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. We welcome uh, Dr. Williams and team up. Uh, and our staff is already ready, so that's good. Uh, as we know, Montgomery College is the largest, and I'm a little biased, the best community college in the, in the uh, state of Maryland and one of the best in the country. And uh, this year, their uh, total uh, operating budget is $345.2 million. That's an increase of $23.4 million, 7.3% from the FY23 approved. Uh, the county executive recommended full funding funding of the of the college's operating budget request, uh, and as noted in the packet, pack, and I'll turn to Dr. Williams momentarily. Um, this is a maintenance of effort budget for the college, um, and uh, they are using other institutional resources to support the growth. And there is a lot of growth happening. East County, other campuses um, are, and other work is happening. Uh, they also are benefiting from increased state aid and increased enrollment, which we're really happy to see um, year on year. Um, and with that, the Education and Culture Committee unanimously supported the approval of the executive's budget recommendation, including the current fund, major facilities reserve fund, and other non-tax supported funds. Um, I'll just see if Dr. Williams wants to say anything before we give you a yes. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Joanda. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you again for the great work and your team's work on the, on the packet. Just to um, share, reiterate uh, the, the good news, yes, enrollment is up. We're up spring over spring for the first time since 2012. Our first time ever in college, student population was up about 10% for fall, and we're looking at an increase for fall over fall when compared to fall 23 fall 22. Uh, as identified, uh, this is a maintenance of effort budget. We're not asking for new funds. This budget will help us keep tuition affordable. It will help us provide fair and reasonable pay raises for all the employees who keep the uh, academic and academic support entities moving at Montgomery College. And it will fulfill our build out of 2221 Broad Birch, as we all know, is East County Education Center. So really appreciate your consideration. And on that note, I'll just uh, leave you with, with one student story and ask you to think about how this resonates. And uh, it's about someone you know. And if you don't know her, you know, you know the story. Jackie Flores. Jackie Flores. <laughs> Jackie Flores, she, she grew up here. She went to school here. She now works here. Um, she went to Quince Orchard. She decided to come to Montgomery College where she received an associate's degree. She then transitioned to USG where she receives her bachelor's. And now she works as operations manager at AstraZeneca. Um, I'm sure you know many Jackie Flores. I'm sure you do. And, and those are the lives that we touch. Those are the community members and residents that we seek to uplift. And with your continued support, uh, we will endeavor and continue to be the community's college and really provide that local homegrown talent for the economic and workforce needs that we have here in the county for today and for the future. I thank you for your time again. Thank you. Uh, staff, did I, I know we have the CIP adjustment. We'll do that in a second. Anything I missed? Okay. So, Mr. President, we have a unanimous recommendation from the committee. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and for the work of the Education and Culture Committee, uh, including uh, Council Member Albernaz, who's joining us virtually, uh, who is under the weather. Um, uh, and Dr. Williams, thank you very much for all the work. And I know that over the last year, the progress that's been made in East County is incredibly exciting. Uh, and uh, thank you for lifting up uh, Jackie's story and all the other success stories that we are able to make here in Montgomery County through our investment in Montgomery College. So thank you. Um, Council Member Balcom has a comment. Uh, I'm going to talk on CIP, sorry. I thought we were doing it all together. Uh, yeah, it is all together. OK. Um, so I just wanted to uh, lift up the um, Student Service Center at Germantown. 
Um, I know that uh, it's on the high priorities list, and I just wanted to lift it up. I think that Montgomery College, uh, with the operating budget uh, at maintenance of effort, I th thank you for, uh, for that. And um, of course, we all support Montgomery College. Uh, the Student Services Center, that was a non-recommended reduction, and so as we head into the reconciliation list, I just ask my colleagues to please uh, make sure that goes through. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Great. I just want to um, underscore uh, what Councilmember um, Balcom just said uh, regarding the restoration of the $2.9 million um, in the CIP for the Germantown Student Services Center. I know um, as we end today and go into the weekend and early next week, we're going to be taking a close look at all of our high priority um, categories, and I just implore my uh, colleagues to make sure that this, this gets into the final budget. Thank you. Yeah. And, and just uh, on the theme of CIP, there is a technical adjustment that has not yet uh, come before the council, so maybe we'll take one minute to describe that. Ms. Hossein will, will describe that. Please do. Good morning, council members. I'm Nazifa Hossein, a postgraduate fellow with the council, and I'll just be covering the uh, Montgomery College technical adjustment section. For Montgomery College, the Council took a straw vote on April 18th to approve the College's CIP as recommended by the Education and Culture Committee. This included adopting the College's non-recommended reductions to address the Executive's affordability reductions and identifying $2.9 in GEO bonds reduced from the Germantown Student Services Center project as a high priority item for restoration during the CIP reconciliation. Afterwards, the college learned the state did not approve funding of $418,000 requested for the Tacoma Park Silver Spring library renovations within the library renovations project. In order to cover the reduced funding, the college is requesting a technical adjustment to transfer $418,000 from the planning, design, and construction project to the college-wide library renovations project. The requested amendments for for each project are detailed in the packet and council staff recommend approval of the technical adjustment as requested by the college. Very good. Thank you for that report out, uh, Ms. Hussain. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you like to move yes, that technical adjustment? Absolutely. I would move to approve this technical adjustment and also associate myself with the comments about Germantown. So appreciate my colleagues making that. I second. Okay. Moved by Chair Jawando, seconded by Councilmember Mink. All those in favor of the technical adjustment, that is unanimous. And not seeing any other comments, all those in favor of the Montgomery College capital and operating budget as approved by uh, the Education and Culture Committee and by today's technical adjustment, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. And Thank team. you. Thank you, council members. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. We are now going to move to an item to talk about uh, county government and the structure of county government, specifically vacancies that exist within county government. Uh, over the last few years, county government has created nearly 1,300 tax-supported positions with nearly 500 of those in Montgomery County government. And as has been a central focus of this year's budget deliberations, there are approximately 1,200 to 1,500 vacancies on any given day. And we know it is a revolving door, but as we are working within a budget that is tight, a budget that is requesting a property tax increase, and a budget that aims to be fair in our compensation for all of Montgomery County and Montgomery County Public School employees, uh, we are doing our due diligence here on the council to make sure that county government is working as efficiently as it can so that taxpayer funds can be used where they're needed. And this conversation is the next step in our discussions with the county executive. I sent a memo about a month ago asking the county executive to help find savings within our personnel, again, recognizing there are between 1,200 and 1,500 vacancies on any given day. And so this conversation uh, 
with council staff, with the chief administrative officer, Mr. Madaleno and his team, um, is the next step in trying to restructure and refine county government as County Executive Elridge pledged to do five years ago. And so I think there is agreement that these steps need to happen um, to work towards that goal of making sure our taxpayer dollars are being used efficiently so that they can go to where we know they are needed. And with that, I'll turn it over to council staff, Mr. Howard, to walk us through the packet. Good morning, council members, and thank you for, um, uh, for having us for this discussion. So as you mentioned, there is approximately 1,500, or when the county executive submitted the budget, there's approximately 1,500 total vacancies, about 1,200 tax supported, and, th and those numbers do change um, every day. Some positions get filled, and then some positions become vacant as, as natural turnover happens throughout, the, uh, throughout departments. The total FY24 personnel costs uh, in the executive's recommended budget associated with the 1,200 tax supported vacant positions as of March 3rd um, was about $110.4 million. So the reason we're having this discussion about laps is that unless all 1,200 positions uh, are filled on July 1st, not all of those dollars will be spent. In part due to the high vacancy rates, the executive did assume a total of $50.95 million in lap savings for tax supported positions in the FY24 budget. This is an increase of $16.3 million over the historical lapse assumption of around $34.7 million uh, that is typically included in the budget. Now these reductions of $50.9 million are not you're already included in the budget that you received. So when you're going over the personnel costs associated with each department, you're not talking about those because those reductions have already been made and assumed by the executive. So in addition to laps from current vacant positions, where, um, which the executive um, tried to uh, assume in, as part of his budget, the county also achieves lap savings when an employee leaves county service. During 2022 calendar year, the county's turnover rate was about 8.6%, and that was similar to 2021. This is an increase from the historical mm -hmm. amount that we had been experiencing for the past, you know, the previous 10 or so years, which had ranged from a low of 5.5% to a high of 7.5%. Mm -hmm. As the OHR director noted um, in the discussion on the OHR budget uh, on Wednesday, uh, this means that approximately 900 county employees are leaving um, service during the course of the year. So in FY22, the county had actually a net reduction of 219 filled positions due to natural turnover. And to date in FY23, there's been a net increase of 128 filled positions. So there have been 780 hires during the, count, during the fiscal year and 652 separations. So as you're thinking about what could happen with laps, you know, as we have around 900 um, positions that naturally turn over during the year, not all of those are getting filled. Some of those take a while to get filled, so there's savings associated with those positions, um, and that's where this additional lapse uh, could potentially come from. Um, on April 18th, the council president sent a memorandum to the county executive that, that you already mentioned, asking for some additional reduction scenarios. And on April 28th, the county executive sent a reply that included two non-recommended reduction scenarios to achieve further lapse savings in, F in the FY24 budget. Um, one scenario showed $8.5 million in savings, and the second scenario showed $9.7 million in savings. Building off the scenarios prepared by the executive, the council staff prepared a third scenario for council consideration that would achieve a similar level of savings, about $8.0 um, $8 million. To do this, council staff analysts reviewed the additional lapse uh, in the executive's non-recommended reduction scenario, scenarios. And we suggest adjustments intended to spread out the increase amongst departments and to reflect any of the reductions uh, already taken by committees during your previous discussions. The three scenarios are shown in the table on page two, um, with the council staff scenario three on the far right side and the executive's two non-recommended scenarios um, in the middle. And it also shows the total recommended lapse in the executive's budget um, that, was, that was included in the March 15th submittal. As noted in the executive's transmittal memorandum, the number of vacant positions does fluctuate daily, and certain departments do have minimum staffing levels or service requirements that must be met regardless of vacancy rates or lapse assumptions. So these factors can lead to increased use of contractors, increased use of overtime, um, use of force folds, and or impact service delivery, uh, depending on the department and, and how the um, scenarios play out. Council staff also notes that under the county charter, the executive does have the ability to transfer up to 10% of a department's appropriation between personnel and operating costs. And an explanation that OMB provided detailing the process for reviewing those requests is attached at Circle 8. 
So overall, given the high vacancy rates and the current turnover rates for county government, council staff recommends that the council consider increasing FY24 lapse assumptions by approximately $8 million, as we've laid out in Scenario 3. In total, this would increase the lapse assumed as part of the FY24 budget to $58.95 million, or around 54% of the FY24 personnel costs associated with the vacant positions as of March 3rd. As noted above, you know, in addition, the, there's expected to be around 900, million, 900 new vacancies that will occur throughout the fiscal year. Um, so there's not just vacancies, not just laps with the vacant positions, but also the turnover that, that will happen throughout the year. And so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. President, for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Howard, uh, for walking us through that. I'll uh, turn it over to CAO Madalino if you have any open comments. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President and uh, members, and for this opportunity. I'm joined with a number of people from uh, across county government department heads, uh, as well as leaders in uh, OMB. Um, I do want to start by um, talking a little bit about vacancies. Uh, I am pleased um, to not only um, have Tracy Anderson as part of our effort to lead OHR, but uh, just finishing um, day five as deputy director of the Office of Human Resources is Dr. Lolita Whedon who is right here. Um, Dr. Whedon joined the libraries a little more than a year ago um, and showed them how to do hiring in a um, efficient and ongoing basis. And so I'm looking at you so that Ms. Vasallo doesn't um, shoot me a, a bad look because she's not the happiest person that Dr. Whedon has moved um, on to the county. But Dr. Whedon joined us from the US Department of the Army and she brings a, an efficiency and an approach to organization that I think is probably um, more a hallmark of an organization like the Army um, than traditionally the Montgomery County government. Um, and she has brought an efficiency to libraries, which we expect um, and know she will bring with Ms. Anderson to the entire county government about how one, an organization is organized in order to fill vacancies. Um, I know over the last several days, you and your colleagues have asked questions about restructuring um, and the county executive's goals about restructuring. And um, I would say uh, shame on me for not getting you all information on an ongoing basis as, as to all of the hard work we are doing every day on restructuring. And that's one of the reasons why I brought Ms. Vasallo here from libraries to talk about some of the outstanding work that she has done with her team in restructuring the libraries, which I don't think we've ever had an opportunity for a variety of reasons. The last few years haven't been the most conducive to lengthy um, public hearings. So um, the report that I know the council vice president has talked about on various occasions where we work with a consultant that quite frankly, in the end, we weren't um, totally thrilled with the material from the report, but it gave us some guideposts for um, how to work on restructuring. And you know, when you've talked about the county executive wanting to do restructuring and doing restructuring, um, I've worried that somehow you're trying to um, uh, conflate restructuring with reducing. And what the county executive has been doing and what he's charged all of us to do is look at ways of how we can do our work in a more efficient way with, um, with a different approach to the complement of employees so that we can free up money that can be used for the other things that are so critical for us to do. I have heard and I probably have the, the chance to spend more time with the county executive than most other people. Um, and that when he talks about restructuring, he talks about it from the context of um, not surprising, he has a lot of things he wants to do for the community. Not surprising, he has a lot of concerns about gaps across the board in a variety of ways for the, for the county. And he has said, if I want to address many of those things, I have to find a way to find the resources, people, time, money, in order to address them. And so part of our task with, was that, with that report was to think through the management structure. Do we have too many managers across um, some departments? Do we have too few in some cases? 
uh, how can we restructure the management team in order to reduce the number of managers, um, empower or as we like to call, liberate employees to do more of the work um, and take on more of the management responsibilities through self-directed teams, which we're doing in libraries, which we're doing in urban districts, for example, and thus free up the money that would have gone to those higher salaries for managers to use for other purposes. If we can reduce um, six managers, not eliminate those positions, but take six management positions um, as they become vacant, um, lower them, I don't want to call it downgrade, but lower them from a management level to a standard merit system position, um, and thus save money on those salaries that we can then rededicate to additional, let's say, um, librarians or other staff in the building to come in and work on literacy skills in some of the libraries where we know there are communities that are struggling with a variety of, of challenges around literacy and English language learning. So that's when he talks about restructuring, and that's what we've been doing. You know, um, Chief Jones is up at the table because one of the things that we've done in the, in the police department to, to reflect some of the challenges we have had with staffing is, as some of you remember from the last term, we reorganized traffic um, and how we handle traffic. Within the, within the police department. And instead of having traffic units in each of the six districts, we did a centralized traffic unit to relieve the districts and to recognize that now we have a, a team of officers we can place on traffic issues when they occur, as they're occurring, where they are a problem, because we know um, traffic in the down county can be very different than traffic in the up county, especially around rush hour. So it's another way where we restructured in order to enhance the delivery of services, meet a need, and not do it for any additional cost. Uh, I appreciate uh, that response, and I appreciate the acknowledgement that the communication of that work needs to be better. Yes. Yes. You and I have had several conversations about Yes, the need to do better communications. Agreed. Um, and with that, I'm going to yield to colleagues who would like to communicate their thoughts with you, starting with the chair of the GEO committee, Councilmember Stewart. Hey, thank you so much. Um, actually, my first question is for uh, Mr. Howard. When we're looking at the council staff scenario three, and it says that the lapse was um, and for each department um, was looked at also by the reductions taken by committees. If you could say a little bit more than that uh, on that point, because um, I, I will say I think it got a bit confusing how different committees were handling um, laps, and we still have a bunch of committees to review this afternoon. So if you could just let us know what assumptions went into that column. Of course. What, what I mean by that is if a committee did take a reduction for a, most committees were looking at positions, not necessarily laps, but if a committee did take a reduction for um, a position or a couple positions, then we included that um, as part of this analysis. For example, the GEO committee recommended laps in the, some county council positions as well as um, Office of Intergovernmental uh, Relations position. So that's been incorporated into this, um, even though that didn't come over that way from the executive. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I think there's just uh, looking at this list, I know we've gone through each of the departments. So I don't want to make people uh, kind of reiterate um, what they've um, uh, mentioned again. But I think I'll, I'll just ha want to um, ask, ask the chief if he would like to speak to uh, the laughs in uh, the police department and uh, regarding public safety. Absolutely. So thank you, council member, for that, and good morning. Um, I think the uh, most important issue surrounding the police department, well, it's twofold. It's uh, first and foremost, um, my emergency communication workers is the largest lapse numbers that, that uh, we have. Uh, we have, I believe, 56 vacant positions in our 911 center. Um, I will tell you that um, it is one of the most challenging issues that we have in order to maintain the morale of those employees who are our 911 uh, call takers and dispatchers. Uh, they are uh, taxed with mandatory overtime 
due to the fact of the shortages that we have. Um, and we've had some extreme challenges in hiring, um, undoubtedly, but it again, um, it's one thing that I think we cannot take our, um, you know, as we're, we're trying to, to move forward, we cannot really slow this train down because we've got um, people who are leaving um, and they tell us the reason, uh, majority of them, the reason why they're leaving is because um, the mandatory overtime is becoming too much in their lives. It's impacting their 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 quality of life. So um, that is something again that uh, we've been trying to come up with some solutions, and we're still working uh, with the county executive in order to address that. But that's a major issue. And then uh, second and foremost is our 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 rank and file of our police department, particularly our patrol officers. Uh, these are our officers again who are our first responders who are answering the 911 calls um, and the, the other calls for service. Um, they are also, we, uh, we have some shortages in our districts um, and it is requiring mandatory overtime callback. Um, and we are really at the max of that. Um, many of our officers are also speaking to us about uh, the impact of uh, those shortages. And again, though there have been, we believe there's movement um, in hiring, uh, we feel very confident um, where we are going, we're moving in a very positive manner um, with the uh, thanks to the county executive and to you as a council in providing the uh, bonuses uh, for for uh, for those who are coming on board. We expect a, a larger class in June, um, and we would hope to have a larger class than that when we are able to, if we're able to do so in uh, January. Um, thank you. So, um, just to ask a follow-up question on that, because this is a I, th as my understanding is what we're talking about is thinking about additional laps um, here. And so do you feel confident um, if we move forward with the bu your budget as has already been um, discussed that those positions would be filled in the next year? Well, I, I can't say that they would all be filled, no. right? right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to put, a, you know, again, uh, as much as I would dream that that would be true, um, I'm not going to give that uh, false indication. Um, but I do believe that we would have a momentum to move some positions forward. Great. Um, thank you. Um, and if, if I could turn to libraries, because I do have to apologize, I was not, I was unable to be here um, when you came before the council because of uh, my duties as the COG board chair. Um, but I know that the uh, decision was made by the committee under the direction of our lead for libraries, Council Member Mink. Um, regard, putting the laps back in as a high priority um, and maybe if you could just highlight um, that again for us. Thank you Council Member Stewart and good uh, morning to everyone on Council. Um, libraries has been uh, dealing with a lapse target of about 5.6% uh, percent um, th throughout the past several years. Um, we have been working, as um, the CAO mentioned, with our former HR manager uh, to really attack our vacancies and get people back into the branches who provide the direct customer service that our residents expect when they come to Montgomery County and they want to see a high-class library system. Um, I brought a little uh, chart here that Dr. Whedon always provided to me. These are the vacancies currently in the department. Everything that you see in orange is currently in active recruitment. Everything that you see in yellow has been uh, completed within the past month or so. So if you see all those orange um, bands, you know that we are working hard to fill these vacancies. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Can I hold it up? Okay. I, 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 I was, I was you, just saying, I've seen them. It's a, it's a real list. Not yes, just a it is a real list. It's a real list of real people, um, but you'll note that most of them are orange, so that goes to show that we're, we are working on these. Um, the the uh, uh, If our lapse target is not reduced, we have determined in the department that come the beginning of the fiscal year, we will stop hiring and we will not be able to hire for some time into fiscal year 24. This is going to impact everything that we do. Um, we put a strategic plan in place that we launched last September. 
It has four important goals for us, and I've, I've been over those with all of you, so I'm not going to go over them again. Um, to also mention um, the reorganization that the CAO uh, spoke about. In 2021, we began to look at the operation of our branches, and we determined that a more effective model would be to um, move to a regional model. We um, took six of our M3 MLS leadership positions and tasked each of them with um, overseeing three or four branches within a geographic area. And then as our um, other M3s have left the department for retirement or another reason we have reclassed those jobs to a grade 25 uh, supervisory position, thus resulting in a savings for each of those six positions that have been regraded. Um, this has allowed us to do some creative work with other positions in the department. We created a, a teen program manager two, uh, the first of its kind for uh, MCPL. This is a person who's overseeing service to teenagers, which is a population that we know is in critical need of services, support, and connection at this time. We also have repurposed a librarian position to be an e-resource librarian. This is someone who's going to manage all of the streaming and downloadable um, resources that we have. Again, a first of its kind position in the department. And we also um, repurposed another position to have us um, hire a performance management and data analyst who has proved extremely valuable to us to make sure that um, we are using the funds that we are allotted in a way that it provides the most benefit to the community. And I have a lot of statistical information about how our program numbers, program attendance have increased in the um, tens of thousands over the past quarter. So the ability for us to um, have the LAPS target as recommended by the CE of uh, 1.2 million will really let us continue with the work that we are doing to be an efficient and effective Department of County Government. Um, I always say that I think libraries um, have more contact with the community uh, than any of the other departments. We're there for everybody. We're across the county. But we need the people in the buildings to be able to do what we have stated we're going to do for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it. And, and I just want to say thank you to um, uh, Director Anderson for all your work. Um, and you been uh, with us a lot over the last few weeks. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll yield back my time. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Stewart. There's a number of people in the queue. Uh, next is Councilmember Sales. Uh, thank you so much um, to our council staff and for uh, the county executive's um, office for sharing how they're going to be restructuring um, the uh, workforce. And um, I think it would be helpful for us to also um, use this post-budget time to reevaluate compensation packages for all of our agencies and um, I just hope that um, we can finalize you know some of these negotiations before the next budget season rolls around um, and um, wanted to talk about some of the numbers so salaries associated with budgeted vacancies total over hundred and ten and a half million um, vacancies that have existed for more than one year total 30 million Vacancies that have existed for more than two years total 14 million. So we have, you know, almost 150 million dollars just waiting in resources that are not being taken care of in our community um, and our police forces at the top. Health and Human Services, Department of Transportation, Department of Corrections, um, these are all resources that need to be taken care of um, and so I'm just going to ask a few questions about in the future would it be possible for us to get a forecasted vision of the um, a forecasted list of the uh, vacancies across the department that have been um, at least five years um, that have been unfilled and maybe start with those. I don't know how you're prioritizing which ones you're restructuring or how you're prioritizing which roles you're 
um, hiring for, if it's based on which ones have been vacant the longest or the current needs of the agency, but that may be helpful in looking at how we're going to be using these very limited resources. If Sure, we would be very happy to sit down with you, um, Council Member Sales, and with um, any other Council Member who, who, who wants to work through some of the, that information um, and figure out a way that we can update you all in a way that is, that is useful and, and also informative as yes. to what's happening. You know, when the, the Chief was talking a little bit about the, the vacancies you know, when you, when you, in the Police Department, when you think of our public safety agencies, they are very much unlike the hiring probably you and I have done at various points of our of our adult lives where um, you're not having to go through an academy to get out. So you, you see with police and fire um, on any given day vacancies that then all of a sudden they have a graduating class and the vacancies drop because we bring this wave of people in and then the numbers climb back up until the next class graduates and we go through that cycle. And you know, right now, for a variety of reasons, we can all talk about why careers in public safety um, and recruiting people into public safety has, has been a challenge here, through the region, throughout the country. So um, you know, we, we ride yeah, a bit of I'm that. Glad. And that's why Craig, Mr. Howard said, on any given day, that's why you know, the, that day after graduation from the police academy, that number will look very different. A day after graduation, the fire academy will look very, very different. So, getting you used to the cadence of the of the of the year um, for vacancies, all of you um, would be, uh, you know, probably very informative. And and over the last few years, we probably haven't done as much of that back office explaining to to everybody yeah. as we I, faced I was on the many executives challenges. Executives transition team. Mm -hmm. I was part of the vision that he had laid out. Uh, when he was first elected uh, almost uh, five years ago. So it would be helpful if we had, uh, you know, insight and maybe a report on that strategic plan that's going to document some of the um, uh, aspirations that you shared today. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the librarians would be expected to lead reading programs for our students or who's going to be able to lead those. So those are helpful things that we need to ensure are being communicated in our job descriptions and in the reports coming here. So we know where money is going to be spent. We know how compensation packages should look like and we can be more proactive and collaborative in that effort. So I uh, will support staff recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad we're having this conversation, and, and thank you for your partnership in this, and, uh, and thank you, Craig, for bringing this forward for discussion. Um, I uh, wanted to make a motion to remove the libraries from this list because, uh, or, or the amount of the elapsed, um, because we, we just voted on this as a body. We had this exact conversation about this exact line item, and the conclusion uh, unanimously of the body was that um, we wanted to make sure that the libraries had this funding. Um, that these are positions that are currently, uh, you know, currently being hired for right now. They are mostly public-facing positions. We are um, using the libraries to enact many of our goals across other departments. Um, and I'm not going to repeat myself because, again, we, we just had this conversation and everybody agreed that we wanted to make sure they had that funding. So um, I think, you know, the rest of it, I think we should continue to discuss. But I just wanted to, to make the motion to take libraries off the table if we could. There's a move by Council Member Mink, the lead for libraries, to remove the libraries item from uh, the staff recommendation, seconded by Council Member Jawanda. I'm going to, you, you good? I'm good. Okay. Uh, next is Council Member Balcom. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Ming, for bringing that up. It was one of the issues that I wanted to talk about. Um, so the vacancies have been very frustrating. It's, uh, we've been talking about it from the very, very first committee meeting, um, and it's been difficult to get uh, get to the crux of it. So um, I, I support this uh, recommendation, staff recommendation, with the uh, amendment that we just discussed, um, but. 
I just wanted to talk about, um, Mr. Mandolino, the, the distinction between the reorganization and reduction of positions. And it's the first time that I've heard that distinction. Uh, when, whenever I've heard the county executive talk about re reorganization, uh, and I've followed this discussion for the past five years, like everybody else, um, and it's the first time that I've heard that distinction. So, and I understand the strategy of finding efficiencies and moving funds uh, up to more higher priorities. And I think that in a time of a flat budget, that makes sense. But the county executive's budget is asking for a 10% tax increase um, with a structural deficit, um, a significant structural deficit that we're going to be talking about a tax increase next year. So I think that at this point in time, we need to look at finding those efficiencies and reducing the size of government. Um, we can look at additional priorities at a different time, but we are, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to, to not pass a 10% property tax increase uh, and 7% for next year. So I just wanted to state that um, I get the distinction. I don't think it's the time for, for that. We need to reduce the size. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I just want to say that I, I really appreciate how the entire council has been focused on the vacancy issue that's before us. and. Thank you to the county executives team for acknowledging the challenges we have by responding with some ideas to help us work through this very, very challenging time. Um, I, I support the staff recommendation uh, that Mr. Howard has put forth because it makes important tweaks to what you sent us back, um, and that I think it's a workable solution for this moment and this budget. And I very much am looking at not just fiscal year 24, but fiscal year 25, as Council Member Balcom just pointed out. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with, the, with what my colleagues have been saying about the larger structural problem with our vacancy issues. You know, part of it being the realignment effort that, that OHR is, is going to be tasked with doing. And I am very thrilled that Director Anderson will be leading that charge. Um, that's way overdue, right? Because we're a 24, 21st century county government, local government, and we have different systems, different tools, different everything. And it's been a hot minute since anybody's gone through all that. And that's a top priority. Um, and again, we face a lot of the same challenges that other local governments and the private sector are facing. Because frankly, the pandemic made folks want to not be in forward facing roles anymore. And the biggest challenges we have are in those areas of employment where front facing was the only option. And there was no, you know, Zoom life <laughs> during the pandemic for those folks. They had to be out and doing those jobs. Um, but even though this will help now in taking this step, I feel pretty strongly that we need to take legislative action to address deeper structural issues within county government. Um, one of those is the way that funding appropriated for positions remain vacant in the departments and repurposed for other uses that we don't get to approve. And I, I appreciate putting the memo in the packet for us um, at Circle 8 that, that goes over that charter provision um, and that 10% mark of a department's budget that can be moved around in that way. And I get it, OMB signs off on it, but we are the fiscal oversight authority and we don't have that opportunity to intervene. It can become much of a rubber stamping kind of process, much to the detriment of our work as a fiscal oversight body when we are dealing with limited resources and we wanna maximize where those dollars are going to make sure we're best serving our residents, right? Um, so I think we need to put stronger guardrails in place to prevent or limit that practice because that's not the way an effective or an efficient government works. Um, so I will, I am firmly committed to pursuing that legislatively throughout the rest of this year and um, with an eye towards how it relates directly to this vacancy issue, but also being mindful of the need to help be more collaborative in the recruiting and retention of our county employees. So thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Can I just say, um, Councilmember Lukey, um, if you want to have that discussion, please have that discussion with us. 
um, because the absolute worst thing we could do is make a change to the charter that makes the government ungovernable, unmanageable. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time at the state. Um, you spent a lot of time at the state. Um, uh, you may feel the state government operates efficiently, inefficiently, and I, none of those rules are in place with our AAA, well-regarded state government. And I, I, I don't want people to think we, we do something out of line, um, out of common practice in Montgomery County compared to other well-regarded, well-managed local governments and state governments. Thank you, Mr. Madalino. But you would agree, would you not, that DBM does have a far more cumbersome process for making those adjustments and changes that is also much more transparent and not a rubber stamp, correct? At the, the Maryland Department of Budget and Management, yes. uh, I would, as a legislator, as a former legislator, I would certainly not say that. But you did not work in the executive agencies that, that, that the is, state is correct? I, 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 yes, but I'm, I'm just trying to say from as a legislator like you are now, uh, it was a very different, um, it was a very different experience. And I, I did not right. feel in any way that the state was, or the state, the executive branch was, was somehow not being um, efficient or effective in carrying out the mission that the voters and the General Assembly set out for the state, for the state government. Right, but in my position, having been serving multiple state agencies in the executive department, I can assure you that that process had a lot more checks and balances to it that are not, in fact, present here. It was one of the first most noticeable things that I saw when I got here. So I appreciate your comments. I look forward to speaking with you further about this. Spend a day with Mr. Waters and you may feel differently about the checks and balances that exist within the executive branch. Sure. Good conversation. I'll remind people that uh, the Montgomery County Charter provides this legislative branch with far more power and responsibility than the Maryland Constitution provides to the General Assembly. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, first of all, let me thank the entire panel for all that you do and for being here. And I do support the staff's recommendation with Councilmember Minks uh, and Councilmember Juando's amendment. I think that it only reminds us what we've already done, <laughs> so I think that becomes very important. And I appreciate and agree with much of what all my colleagues have said, and I especially agree with what Councilmember Balcom and Councilmember Lukey, just their thoughts on what we need to do. But we need to be able to do what we need to do with all of the additional information that I know that you're going to be providing to us. We need to do this with our eyes wide open. This is not an easy item. Um, we all have said over the years, over the years, that we're concerned about vacancies. And mandatory overtime, as the chief mentioned, is not healthy, both literally and fiscally and physically. It is not the way we should be doing business. We have a very fine police department, a very fine uh, fire department. We have a very fine, we can go down, uh, library, we can go down the list of everyone we have, but if you burn out your employees, you're not going to have that fine, those fine departments that we have. To, to the, to the uh, chief's earlier statements, there's a limit on how many people we can put through the academies of it in, a, in a given year. We, you, as much as you would like to, to have as ma every one of them filled, there's, there's, a, there's a spot where that can't be filled anymore. And of course, training and, is very important and one that we make certain that our that air employees, fire, every employee have, have the highest standards associated with it, and we cannot in any way change that. I've said, uh, Mr. Manolino, you, before that, that I've been concerned that, and when we talk about lapses, that if we say, well, you know, we can hire this one in January, we can hire whatever it is, that we should be able to advertise before that, even though the money is not there, that we should be able to advertise before that so that when the money is there, that that person can then be hired. And so I've been told uh, on numerous occasions that that is something that we do. See Mr. Water shaking his head. So, uh, but I also believe that we need to be reminded that that is what we are doing. 
we are going to hit the ground running when we actually have the money on, on the uh, available. I've, I've said during air discussions and uh, and uh, Human Resources Director Ms. Anderson has been here much more than she probably would like to be, but she has done an extremely good job and put up with a with a lot of discussion uh, and and is and is going to I know do a, turn this this train around for us. But we have to make, and her entire team, I don't want to just, I know it's not just her, but the, the jobs that are vacant, it, she reminded us during government operations, and we've heard it before, but it just sort of hit home, that many of these jobs that are vacant are filled by contractors. And I believe that we should have a column that says, these are the jobs that are vacant, and these are the, whatever the number is, and that these are the jobs that have been backfilled by contractors. I, so that someone is doing that work, whether it's a county employee or some other employee, but that work is being done and how, and, and in many cases, the contractor is, is more expensive to the county than, than, the, than the employee would be, and the employee would be getting more if they actually work for the county with benefits and everything else associated with it. So we need to have that information. That's something we need on the list. I, I believe that, um, that the, the uh, uh, better way to talk about vacancies and say how many are filled currently would be to, to have that, that conversation. And we need to also know if there has been a vacancy that's not filled by contractors, how that job that that vacancy has created, how that job is being done today, and if it means that somebody is doing, you know, uh, the overtime or whatever it is, we need to know that, or we need to know that that job really did not need to be a job at this point in Montgomery County. Times change, and we need to be keeping up to date on that. I, I uh, appreciate everything that's being done, and I believe that we have got to um, candidly stop talking about it and actually having this accomplished. I think it's to everyone's benefit. Um, th thank you very much, Councilmember Katz. Um, two things. One, um, one of the reasons why we were very excited that Dr. Whedon was willing to take on a greater leadership position within the county government was the organization she brought and the discipline she brought to the libraries for hiring. Um, she has um, collaborated with our innovation team other hiring managers across county government and Ms. Anderson to come out with a very simple guide how to fill a position in 30 days. Also important. And so, um, and that's what libraries started to do. And there are, there are a lot of rules we have to follow. You have to go through a training to be on an interview panel. Well, you need to have lots of people um, signed up to be able to interview. Don't just wait for everyone's resumes to come in, look at the resumes, and then decide, here are the 10 people we want to interview. Now let's figure out everyone's calendar to see when, when they are. She has insisted that everyone is going to be the interview team. When the job ad is sent out, that's when you fill out the, that's when you determine what are the interview slots that are available so that when you, when you're right ready to go, when you've got the, the, um, the candidate list, you can put them right into the interviews and get it done. So all of those smart things that for a lot of reasons, um, we got um, unaccustomed to doing in an organized way during the hiring freeze, during the pandemic, during a lot of reasons over over the last over the last decade. Um, so um, that's why we're trying to focus on we can't let these things we can't let these vacancies sit out there because quite frankly, it's not fair to the other employees who are doing you know 50 percent more work, 100 percent more work filling in for all of the vacancies. They're struggling with contractors. It's great to have a contractor to backfill, but to hear someone, I get a train, who I don't know if is going to be here for the next three weeks. You really three aren't months. saying him. Not, not, I, I just wanted to make uh, I've yeah. already struggled the with Mr. Arlowski. Yeah, 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 got him. Yes, right yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you know, but you got to do, you, you, you got to do that work. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased at that. Um, if you want to hear, Mr. President, members, you know, the, the department that has the most contractors on board um, for a variety of reasons is the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Bridgers is here and can talk, can talk about that if you, if you want, but that's one of the things the county executive has said from day one, let's get 
full-time employees in those positions, that get people who have access to a pension, to health care, to other benefits. That's a better thing that makes for a happier, more committed, long-term employee as opposed to someone not who you're always churning with people in and out and stability to the workforce. And, and I appreciate it. I don't know that we should be getting into the weeds of every uh, of every department. The, the Health and Human Services uh, 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 certainly does a wonderful job and we know we have issues there. But Ms. President, I'm going to turn it back to you because I think we do need to move on, but I think that this conversation is the beginning of a very long conversation. Thank you. I agree with that. We have a few more speakers. Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, hey, everybody, and I apologize for not being able to be there in person with all of you and in solidarity, but, uh, and I appreciated the Chief Administrative Officer's comments and the staff packet. I do support option three, um, and I won't support the amendment, and I'll explain why. So if nothing changes uh, between now and FY25, and we hit the recession that many economists are predicting, the downsizing of government is going to be decided for all of us because uh, we are in a situation right now in which the decisions we're making today, regardless of whether or not we pass an even 10% property tax increase, is demonstrated by our staff packets earlier to not be sustainable. And so I think we do have to make difficult decisions now, and I think option three is reasonable in spreading out uh, among all of the respective departments, uh, having to take that into account. And as I mentioned you know, in a previous session, uh, I've been through this before. Uh, and when we had to cut over 38% cumulatively of our Department of Recreation staff over three years, we went through reorganizations because we had to in order to maintain operations. Uh, reorganizing county government is, is challenging, to say the least. And so I understand where Chief Administrative Officer Madalino is coming from in trying to sort of adjust. I, I'm actually glad, though, that um, we didn't fully uh, implement the initial recommendations, because county government has changed in the last three years in ways that none of us could have ever imagined um, because of COVID. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a prime time uh, for us to continue this conversation and make sure that we are doing so in a way that takes into account the new normal um, that all of us have and the manner in which we deliver services to our community and public. So uh, as much as I would prefer not uh, to have to take the, this or any of the other reductions we're going to be discussing this morning, um, I, I think it would be prudent for us to stay the course and to make tough decisions now because we're going to have to make even more difficult decisions later. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much uh, and hope you're feeling better. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, so on the motion, I'll speak to, speak to that first. I seconded it. Obviously, I'm in support of it. I don't think we should, we made the decision. We also have made great progress on the LAPS issue. I, when I was lead for libraries last year, we had 100 plus vacancies. That's been cut in half and all the orange on the chart shows how many are in process uh, to be hired. Our libraries have done so much over the course of the last three years. Uh, the job of librarian has fundamentally, it was already changing, it's even fundamentally more changed. Um, and so I don't know why we would not recognize that and allow that hiring to continue for such important front-facing positions. All of the positions are important, but I think the level and pace of success of reducing laps that the libraries has demonstrated is exemplary and we should uh, acknowledge that here. So I'll support that. Um, I do want to reiterate, since you're here, Mr. Magdaleno, that I did to Ms. Anderson and others, and we have OMB to, here today, the process of reorganization, we need a clear timeline. Uh, and whoever's leading that, I was told by OHR that it's OMB, which is fine, and I, I, want, I want you to respond to that. But we need to understand what that looks like, what the timeline is, what the 500000 for the study for the consultant is going to do and what their scope of work and timeline is. I, I, don't, we, I don't think anyone up here has answers to those questions. I know I don't. Um, and so... I'd love an answer now at a high level, but we need something in writing to say, because, you know, I, look, the pandemic happened and I've given you a lot of grace on that. 
It's hard to restructure when a once in a century pandemic happens. Fine. But we need a plan and we need to know what the money for this consultant is going to do and how we're going to get there. It's obviously tied to this larger vacancy issue. I agree with you, paid, well compensated, with benefits, uh, staff are the better way to go so we can reduce consultants and reduce burnout and not have this cyclical cycle of people leaving and retiring early. So we all agree on that. But talk to me, at least generally now, about what the timeline and plan is in use of those dollars. So I, I believe you're talking about the $500,000 that's in the OHR budget for a reclassification study. Correct. Yeah. So well, let's set that aside. Yes, absolutely. But talk first about the OMB process for restructuring government. That's being led by OMB, correct? So um, we, we are, I mean, what, what I tried to, to say before, we, we are trying to restructure government e each and every day. I, I don't, there, there, there is, we, we need to give you all and the community um, a, an outline of or a report of all of the things that we have done over the last several years um, for restructuring, the things that we are um, continuing to look at for, for restructuring. Um, I, I don't want to leave anyone with the grand idea that there is a, uh, the idea that there is some, there is a grand plan to reorganize county government by um, taking half of HHS and putting it in HCA and do I, I mean, I, I, th that, that hasn't been um, on the on the table, um, and we we've talked through um, in at many times when we've when we when we've talked about are some of the agencies too big, and that's the problem, um, and creates inefficiencies. Should they be should they be smaller? If you do that, then you, you create potentially inadvertently more administrative staff because everyone all you know. Once you get to a certain size, you need a budget manager, you need a, a procurement manager, you need a, a, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what, you, yeah. you, you, you know, so you, you need a variety of, of people to do the backbone of the organization and we haven't wanted to go down, to go down that path. So, I mean, we are, so we, just, just, if I could just pause you, all important considerations, who is leading the process to have the restructuring? Is, is there someone in charge? Are so you in I'm charge of I'm that? in charge. Okay. I, I'm in charge so, every so, every day about it. And I'm, I have that conversation almost every meeting with every department head got it. about okay. what, what we can do. But uh, during that time, I don't I don't want to leave people with uh, There's no grand also plan. the impression. Well, I mean, I'm we're using opening your words, a new, not mine. Right. There is there there uh, we've never said we're going to have a we're going to have a specific Montgomery plan for you next year. We totally know we spend time with the revenues. We understand the challenges that we're coming up against. We understand how to that we have to carefully manage this government over the next year, over the next multiple years that we have the honor to serve in these roles, in order to make sure it's it's affordable. But I, I don't think anyone I don't think anyone has anyone has pledged a. Well, a, a, I don't know about that. I, I mean, I remember we were all running at the same time five years ago. And, yes. And, and I remember the county executive saying there would be a plan to restructure government. I don't have the Bethesda beat quotes. I'm sure they'll be pulled after this meeting. And, and, and I'm saying we've, and we've done that. We've done that uh, each and every day in this office. And, no, no, no. The plan. I, no, Ms. Vassallo explained the restructuring. Parts, but I, what, I, what you're hearing, I think, from everybody, and, and again, I, I gave you a lot of leeway during the pandemic. We have to, in order for us to be partners with you and to not have to send a letter about the 1500 vacancies and to not have to ask what the OHR component is doing on reclassification, which certainly would play a role in mm -hmm. a larger restructuring. That's why I brought mm -hmm. it up. We need to, you need to put together a plan and talk to us about it. The county executive and you as his management of the government needs to put together a plan and talk to us about it. And it's a complicated, it's a lot of components. The question of what agencies could be smaller, if not, what, what would need to have more staff, what's the role of middle management, things we've talked to the unions about for years, that needs to be laid out and discussed. And so if there isn't a grand document or plan, that needs to exist, because I don't know how we can have the conversation and isolate, you know, without that. So that's, okay. that would be my suggestion to you. I, and I, I would love to work with you on that and with the county executive, just as we've been sitting up here, I, I, 
I yeah. get it. And I know you want to do. You, you've yeah. been you've been giving me one set of information. I've gotten some other information of. I don't want a plan for restructuring. I want a plan for reducing government. Those those are two very well, different. Those are two very different things. They, there's overlap there, but I I think we need one has to go with the other. So. I think you understand my point. Oh, I do. Okay, and I, and I, I think it's shared by colleagues, and, uh, you know, but I'll, I'll yield back. I appreciate it. Uh, this council is united in wanting to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are being used as efficiently as possible so that we can pay our workers, we can help our students, we can increase our social safety net. This budget and this deliberate, deliberative discussion over the last month only proves that. Council I don't President. think the county executive would disagree with anything you just said. We're in agreement. Yes. We just need better communication. Council Vice President Friesen. Appreciate, I really appreciate the line of questioning from colleagues. Uh, and um, respectfully, I don't agree that we haven't heard a pledge or been told that there is going to be a grand plan. And I do think, to a certain extent, a lot of us feel like it's a little bit like Infrastructure Week, where we have been hearing year after year after year that mm -hmm. it was coming, and it hasn't come. And We've made tough decision after tough decision, and it's always been, but don't worry, right behind this, on the heels of this decision, we're going to do the work. We're going to do the restructuring. And the reality is the directors are doing a great job. So let me just say that from the outset. Ms. Anderson, you are doing a terrific job. Ms. Fasalo, you're doing a great job. We had an acute problem in libraries. You brought in a terrific new staff member. You came up with a plan. You executed that plan. That's not the problem. The problem is that there isn't a cohesive plan from the county executive and from you. It took 10 minutes in the line of questioning to just verify that you're the person who's leading this effort and still up to this point, I'm not clear, I don't know that anybody is clear what the plan actually is, what direction is being given to the directors. And respectfully, I'll quote the county executive, I feel that before you go talk about a tax increase, I would have to demonstrate to people that I've done everything I can to lean out the government, the county government, to make sure we're as efficient as possible, that I've taken people and been able to repurpose them rather than just go into taxes first. I think the days of going to taxes first are over. End quote, new quote, far from saddling taxpayers with higher bills, I will streamline county government, unions and their members, our county's workforce, know and trust me. That is why we announced our plan to restructure county government together. Our county is facing difficult financial times without thoughtful changes employees will face across the board cuts. Last quote. Do you want to I've explained though, how I would begin to rethink quotes, government. Council Member Friedson. Pardon? Can you, can you cite those quotes? I mean, I'd be happy to sit here and also read you quotes from over the years that you've said. And each, each, you, please do, please do, because I think I've been pretty consistent in asking for the restructuring plan, and I don't think that we have heard it. And so I just think, first of all, you, you hired the consultant, $92,000. Today was the first day that we have heard publicly that you don't agree with the consultant's report. So I think it would be helpful if you would share with us what of the report you agree with, what you don't agree with, what you are executing, and what you are not executing because you don't agree with it and why. Because we spent $92,000, we were told in the fall of 2020 that we were gonna start this plan that was delayed Mm -hmm. to have restructuring and that this consultant was going to lead this effort with a team that included the labor force and by the way the conversations that I have with labor partners this is that they are as frustrated about this as the council is and they have been consistent about that too that they participated in these restructuring conversations they were part of this working group that you apparently disagree with its conclusions so I said it had weaknesses well it would be helpful for us to understand what those weaknesses are and what the position of the county executive and your office are about this. Mm -hmm. It would also be helpful for us to understand what specific guidance related to restructuring each department has been given and what metrics you are using to help them. Because again, I think the directors are doing a great job. I think that they are trying the best they can, but as we heard in one of the conversations recently about the vacancies, the, the term the department owns that job was used. And I don't, I'm not criticizing that use of the term, but the reality is that's the way that it works within different departments. They naturally are going to hold on to their positions. They naturally are going to be thinking about running of their department. And what we need 
is leadership and management that is looking enterprise-wide to find the efficiencies that we've been talking about. And that's what the council really hasn't seen. And I don't think it's fair to the staff and our workforce. I don't think it's fair to the directors to not have a clear vision for what you and the county executive would like to see as part of this restructuring and reorganization. What the plan is for how we're going to accomplish it and what the execution is going to be and the tools that you're gonna to provide to help make that happen. You're, you have mentioned about the fact that this is a reorganization is not about reduction. And I think all of us could accept that. But this isn't about reduction. This is about a significant expansion. And the challenge that I think many of us have had is that county government has been increasing with hundreds and hundreds of new positions while we're sitting on lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of vacancies. And there isn't any thought to how we can repurpose existing positions to make those changes. Nobody is talking about eliminating positions and team members. It's a question of when a position becomes vacant, do we rethink whether or not it is the most useful position, whether or not it meets current urgent needs in that department, whether or not it meets current and urgent needs for the county, and whether or not there are changes between departments that need to happen. Up to this point, that hasn't happened. We have been told there's going to be a plan, so if there's not, a broad restructuring reorganization plan that is news today that we have just learned here for the first time but it would be helpful if you would share with us specifically what the direction is that you so, are providing to departments and you can provide it in writing to us specifically the accomplishments and i know lots of departments individually have had lots of accomplishments but we haven't seen it enterprise-wide and I see Dr. Bridgers you know, behind, and HHS has had lots of challenges. Obviously, in public safety, we've had lots of challenges. They are doing everything they possibly can on a daily basis, but they need to know what they're being asked and tasked to do. They are not the county executive. They are not the chief administrative officer. They are the directors of their individual departments, and they're working every day to put out the fires and to keep the trains running, and they need to have guidance. So if, if you could share that with us, it doesn't have to be today. It's not going to be a budget-related decision. We need to see that, and I do think it's communication, but I also think that it's more than that. I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Vice President Friesen. Uh, final word on this, Councilmember Mink. With appreciation for the conversation, and I just wanted to note that as somebody who is new to the council and has viewed this conversation from the outside and now uh, to, to a limited extent now from the inside, um, my impression is that this is obviously something that we all care deeply about. I also genuinely believe that this is something that the county executive cares about. And so I think that if we can engage in, in good faith, I think there's a lot of frustration because we have not set up the right precedents that are going to satisfy everybody, and I include the, the public in that. Um, but I think that we can work together to, to improve that and come to a good place, and we look forward in working in partnership to do that, which I think is what will be the most productive use of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so before us, we have a motion from Council Member Mink uh, and seconded by Council Member Jawando uh, to uh, strike the reductions to the library department. All those in favor of that motion? All those against? And that is nine to two. Um, and uh, before we go to the final vote here, uh, I will just say that I appreciate my colleagues and the dialogue and the executive branch. Uh, clearly there are uh, similarities in what we're saying and the direction we want to go in. We just need to better articulate that. We need to hear what the plan is, what the vision is, and I'd like to follow up after this budget uh, to get more information and to continue this important dialogue. And, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, I agree. And, um, thank you to all of you who have made um, complimentary comments about the staff and all, all the people that are working to lead this county government. They are an impressive group, and I'm honored each and every day to work with them, and I'm glad that you and many people in the community feel the same way because of what we do each and every day for the million-plus residents of this county, which you so articulately talk about whenever you can. Very good. We, we understand there's challenges in hiring, as has been noted. Uh, but ultimately, government is about customer service and providing the services that our residents need. And if money is being put into the budget for positions that cannot be filled, in addition to the new positions that this budget is proposing, we want to make sure that those funds are used in other ways to provide customer services. 
That's really what this comes down to. Uh, so all those in favor with the amendment to the staff recommendation regarding vacancies across county government, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Uh, thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Madaleno. Thank you to the team. Next, we're going to transition to the proposed budget for Montgomery County Public Schools and wait for the superintendent, her team, and the Board of Education to work their way up to the desk. Okay, President Silvestri, good to see you. Dr. McKnight, good to see you and team. So it is really important to start this conversation um, with an important framework that Montgomery County Public Schools um, takes and occupies more than 50% of the county's budget. And so it is an, a critically important part of our budget deliberations. And this budget is unlike one this county has ever had. It, it is the first time that the county executive is proposing to increase property taxes using a state law that only requires a simple majority of the council to do so, six, six members. But what is also equally important for people to understand is that while it might only take a simple majority to increase funds, it requires eight individuals to use those funds, to expend those funds, to exceed the spending affordability guidelines. And so that's the framework in which we have to enter this conversation. And we know the needs that exist. We know our kids need help. We know our teachers need support. They need to be paid fairly. We know the inflationary pressures. We know the hiring challenges. We just had an hour and a half long conversation to talk about that. And so now we are going to have a good conversation about the budget. And it's also important to note that while we're talking about MCPS's operating budget today, earlier this week, this body passed changes to our recordation tax that will provide more money for school construction and for infrastructure. And that's an important part to keep in mind as well. And so to set the guidelines for this conversation, um, I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee um, to walk us through the packet. And then we'll turn to colleagues who will each have 10 minutes to engage in a conversation, which allows for nearly two hours of conversation if individuals, colleagues wish to ask a follow-up question or state something else, you can have a second round as well. But I want to provide for enough conversation to warrant the oversight that residents demand and to make sure that we are being good stewards of more than $3 billion of our taxpayer funds. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Jawanda. Thank you. Thank you, President Glass, and appreciate those comments, and good to see uh, President Silvestri and Dr. McKnight and the team and, and our staff and all those who are here watching. I, my colleagues, new and old, know I have a saying for the millions watching at home, I think I'm right today um, that, uh, that that is probably happening. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, there's a clear need that's been expressed. Um, by our school community that reflects the needs of educators, administrators, and support staff across MCPS. Uh, our children uh, uh, have, are crying out to us, literally, uh, for help in mental health and social emotional well-being. Uh, and this council has heard that. The committee has heard that. 
Um, our community, I think, has heard that, and, and, and we need to act. There's no doubt, there's no disagreement about that. Our teachers are asking for better compensation to be able to work and live in this county. They're asking for more social and emotional support for student well-being. Teachers are asking for more time to plan and make sure that there's resources for professional development. They're asking for us to invest in programming to help students excel in the classroom and outside. And on Tuesday, uh, this council uh, expressed, uh, I think in a, it was a uh, interesting day, but we talked about personally all of our personal experiences with teachers and that what they've meant to us in our lives. So we, that's understood. Uh, the Education and Culture Committee, I've been in the helm for uh, you know, five months now and uh, seems longer. Um, and we've, uh, from the beginning, uh, we framed our work uh, and I had the joy of sitting on that committee uh, with Council Member Rice, who was chair for many years, and Council Member Navarro, who used to sit on the Board of Education, and, and learned a lot uh, about our school system, obviously, as a parent of MCPS students, uh, as a, a former MCPS student myself, about how big the operation is and how complex it is and how many layers there are. We are the largest school system in Maryland, one of the top 15 largest in the country, um, and growing. Uh, and so we set a, a standard at the beginning of our Education and Culture Committee. We sent a letter uh, to the superintendent, to the board, saying we are going to be data-driven and focused because you are nearly half of our budget and the county demands it. And because of this once-in-a-century uh, pandemic that has changed fundamentally everything in our society, but certainly education, uh, that we need to have a laser focus on where are we, where are our students, what are the needs in the system of everyone who's supporting our students, our teachers, our fact, our administrators, the parents, the community, but what is working and what is not working in a data-driven way? We don't have time or money to invest in things that aren't working. Um, and then how do we make adjustments? Um, in our three co committee work sessions on the MCPS budget, uh, the first was a budget review of the revenues and expenditures, including a review of federal, ex uh, federal funding that came to the school system. We discussed vacancies and we reviewed the technology modernization capital improvements project. Uh, at our second session on April 26, we focused on su supports for math and literacy. We know that that's a huge challenge, not only in MCPS but across the country. Uh, our evidence of learning standards, how are we performing and how are we tracking that over time? Uh, and we reviewed the FY24 accelerators, uh, which are part of the budget that was submitted uh, to us. And at our third work session on May 4th, just uh, last week, we discussed updates on those items. We discussed special education services, the anti-racist system audit, other staffing. Uh, we had our, sta our uh, association partners at the table to talk about the real, real needs uh, in staffing and the, the long-term sub-issue and all the issues that are real and we all see every day. Uh, and we made a ultimately a funding uh, recommendation. Um, and it was a 3-0 uh, vote, uh, and we unanimously recommended nine increments, totaling $201 million, uh, with seven increments, $156 million, designated as high priority, consistent with what we've done in the budget process at this point, uh, and two of those increments uh, as priority. Uh, I stated at the time uh, that my goal would be to try to make sure that we could get one of those or both of those priorities moved up in the budget, but that we thought it was important to send a message that the full council could consider all of those nine increments uh, and have the discussion and make a decision as a body. Um, and it, so it wasn't easy. It's not going to be easy, but I feel like the system has worked with us and will need to continue to work with us to structure the resources, the accountability, uh, the review, with the committee and the council so that we can have strong transparency and accountability and strong success, which is the history of this system. Um, and so with that, uh, Mr. President, to get kick this off, I would just like to make a motion that we add the uh, one of these increments that was a priority as a high priority. And I, I appreciate your discussion about how we will have the discussion. Uh, with all the colleagues, but I just wanted to get that on the table uh, in case I don't get heard from again for a while. 
Uh, so I so I will make that motion. Restate specifically what the motion what? is to rem to take one of the priority uh, buckets, and these are twenty two point three million dollar buckets. We put nine on the reconciliation list. Seven is high priority. Two is priority. My recommendation would be that we move one of those priorities to high priority. Very good. Uh, I'll the, second the motion. The chair of the education committee uh, motions to move one of the priority uh, line items to high priority, seconded by Councilmember Mink. Councilmember yeah. Mink. And just uh, you, one other claim. Just yeah, just for okay. a second. Um, at some point, we should, you know, whenever you deem appropriate. Uh, if the school's president and the system want to say anything or response to questions, it's probably the better way to do it, but I defer to you. Do you want to invite any comment during your time? Okay, so I get my 10 minutes. So uh, would would you like to take a minute of my time, Dr. McKnight or Do or President Sylvester? I'm happy to give it to you. I've, met, I've said what I need to say. Okay. Well, good morning, council members. It's a pleasure to be here before you to address you before you make these very important decisions. Um, I'm going to scrap the remarks, but just get to the point uh, since we're taking up all of council member Juwanda's time. Um, as President Evans stated, you know the reality that we're in. You know that the poverty of our families and our school system is 43 percent. You know the need is great. You know we need to be competitive. You know the ESSER money is already allocated to important things like summer school, like tutoring, like mental health. Um, but we are, and you have an important decision to make today, and we are your partners on the Board of Education. We were elected by the people of Montgomery County to provide oversight and accountability of our school system. And we do exactly just that. We worked with the superintendent over four work sessions to look at the budget chapter by chapter. First, we started out with what we, re we could repurpose. We found $12 million that we could repurpose to put to our budget for this year. That's all. It's just to give you an idea of how, much, how everything is allocated. We are a people institution. Everybody has a job to fulfill. The, our budget comprises of the ask that we're asking additional this year comprises of new student enrollment, inflation costs, the accelerators, and staff compensation. Now, the accelerators are not nice to have. You know, we have uh, 40 ESOL teachers just to keep up with enrollment. We have 10 security assistants. We have mandated blueprint requirements. Those are all important, are high priority. So what I ask you today is we all want to uh, compensate our staff accordingly. We signed our agreements with our associations yesterday. We want to honor those agreements, but we also want to honor what our students need. We have to keep up with a student enrollment. We have to keep up with inflation. We have to keep up with those accelerators. So our, my ask today is that you not only help us to meet our compensation agreements, but also help us meet the needs of our students in the classroom. Dr. McKnight, you, yeah. you briefly want to make some comments? Yes, I, I will try my best briefly. First, I want to say thank you. You've been on my mind all week, knowing that today would be a very <laughs> critical point in time in which a tough decision is going to have to be made. And I acknowledge that. And I start with you all personally, because what I know is that every individual that is sitting in front of me, because I've spoken to you, have an interest in the success of children in this district. And I know that. How we get there is going to be tough. But I am going to be the advocate for the children at the end of every single day. And as I think about being the advocate for the children, I have to think about all of the over 25,000 people who have to do this work. And I get it. I know we have a very difficult budget to balance. But I ask that in our conversation today, we do not try to balance that budget on the backs of our children. We have to consider where we are today is a very different time than we've seen in public education ever, ever. I'm lucky I get to sit here and serve as a superintendent during one, one of the most challenging times. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. But because I'm here, I am going to be clear, honest, upfront, transparent, all of that around what the needs are 
and be a fierce advocate for meeting those needs along with our Board of Education and the staff who have to do the work. And so as we go into this conversation today, I ask you, look at all of our children as high priority, every single one of them. I see it no other way. And that's because I am talking to their parents. I know the emails you get because I get them too. And this is everybody's concern. I have to say to you, we're at a pivotal point in public education and in education right here in Montgomery County Public Schools in which we have to make a decision. This is a school system that has a strong reputation and brand that must be upkept by many to protect our interests. I don't know the last time you all have ever had to go into the house hunt process. I have over the past year. And I will tell you, this is not what anyone says to me, it's what I've experienced. And I get so lucky sometimes that I can change my hair and people don't know who I am, <laughs> right? And so as I'm out, you know the first thing they say before they know who I am? We have a great school system. And you know the pride that I feel inside because they don't even know who I am and they're saying that? So when we have this conversation today, we have to think about the conversation that is happening nationally and the conversation we've had a front row seat to here in Montgomery County that says, our children need better and more investments to keep them safe. That our children need better investments in the classroom to meet their needs. And I promise you, this isn't, these are not just my words and I will end on this. Everything we do, we're not doing it because we want accolades. Because quite frankly, if that's the case, I think we'd be probably doing many other things because people aren't always nice to public education, especially over the last year, which is interesting to me. One of the most difficult times, but we do our homework. This morning, this is what I was reading from Harvard Graduate School of Education, titled, New Data Show How the Pandemic Affected Learning Across Whole Communities. And I'm just gonna end with this, but a few things in here that I just thought was really important to say. They said that they found that where children lived during the pandemic mattered more to their academic progress than their family background, income, or internet speed. In this article, it says, it is simply not going to happen without an increase on instructional time. One of the things that our accelerators address. It says the educational impacts of the pandemic were not only historically large, but were disproportionately visited on communities with many low income and minority students. Our research shows that schools were far from the only cause of decrease in learning. The pandemic affected children through many ways, but they are the institution best suited to remedy the unequal impacts of the pandemic. We are the institution, not my words, national research. And it also talks about trust and how local governments have to think about the investment differently to address the needs of our students. So I am looking forward to the conversation today. And I know that it's gonna to be tough and we're gonna ask difficult questions. You're gonna ask difficult questions, we're gonna answer. But I also believe in my heart that we're gonna walk away because we all do care about the school system and love the school system and want it to be successful. And we also know that we have to be accountable to that. The Board of Education understands that. You know, not only are we a board, are they a board that represents majority female representation, but over 40 years of experience in leading, leading in education, leading in social justice, in federal government. I could go on. There's so much that makes up the gravitas of the people who understand and know what accountability means. So we're here to have this conversation today so that we can better understand and you can better understand, the public can better understand why these investments are important. Thank you. Thank you, President Silvestre. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, we are all are on the same team. We all support public education. We all support our teachers. We all support our students. And there's another similarity. Both the Board of Education and the Montgomery County Council are majority female. I think that's important. And I welcome that diversity. And with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Mink for the first round. Thank you. Um, Appreciate all of those comments, uh, and I and I 
I'm really looking forward to the conversation here today, and thank you to everybody who's in the audience. Um, I agree with what the council president just said. We are all on the, all on the same team here, uh, and I know that it is tough because uh, emotions are high. That's because this is important to everyone. Um, I have had some really good conversation with colleagues. I've been trying to, I, haven't, I don't think I've quite gotten everyone, but I've um, been trying to make the rounds. And it, it is clear to me that what we, we don't need here to convince people to care about our students or to care about our kids. Uh, there's nobody up here who doesn't care about our students and care, you know, care about making sure that our schools are, uh, you know, are, are what they need to be. I think that um, uh, it, you know, it, it does come down to a question of numbers because, again, we have a very tight budget uh, across the board, and we can't afford to give any excess anywhere because everybody is going to be running on everybody's running on on less than they would ideally have. Um, of course, we're talking about a tax increase that has that has implications as well. So none of these decisions can be taken can be taken lightly. Um, as a former teacher, of course, I have a special place in my heart for schools, um, but. I also, uh, you know, beyond my, my own emotional ties, want to acknowledge that schools are also different from a lot of these other departments because they roll directly into so many other issue areas. Um, everything the county funds is important and that's why we fund it. Um, but this is, th this, is, this is an agency that touches more people than, than anything else. It's why the budget is so big here. Um, we are serving more people. More people experience the impact of the service provided by MCPS than, any, than anything else that we're going to fund. Um, and the results impact everything. Um, a lot of people, to your point, Dr. McKnight, so many people move here because they say, oh, the schools are great, the schools are great. Like that, That's true. It doesn't mean we can just willy-nilly give tons of money for no apparent reason, but of course, well, there's Willie Nilly again. That's a, let me not say that. But <laughs> I know nobody's suggesting that. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it does, it does uh, um, highlight the point that we have to be careful that we don't cut too much, right? Because those, those implications are, are so great. Um, this is also, we're turning to MCPS to solve a lot of our workforce issues. We are asking MCPS to work closely with um, with Montgomery College. We're, I mean, we're, we're creating, we're investing in creating these pipelines to address the shortfalls that we are seeing in other county departments and in other areas. Uh, and so, if MCPS isn't working, uh, we are going to have other greater staffing problems down the line because this is supposed to be the solution. Um, so again, uh, I think we're actually all in agreement on those facts, and my understanding from the conversations have been that we all, we just need, there just needs to be a better understanding of what truly, truly, truly is needed. There's gonna be a little bit of debate and opinion in there, right? Obviously, as there are with any of these, um, but I don't, think that, I don't think that it's probably that enormous that we can't come to a place that makes sense. Um, noting that, um, to, to get a little bit into the weeds here, that we are looking at um, the expenses that are going to be that are going to be funded with this additional request. We're looking above the base budget here. Um, if we put aside the non-state required accelerators, and um, and this is for you know the public's understanding also, but we've been talking about transparency. Um, and again, this is information that I think that, that colleagues are interested in. Um, that comes out to $255 million. And this is, I'm not saying that of the non-state required accelerators that those aren't important. I'm saying that that's where there's more conversation, right, about where is their flex and there's probably more opinions about what's more important and so on. If we look at the cost that everybody I think is going to agree on, basically, that comes out to $255 million. And so that includes the staff contracts, that's the lion's share of that, which again, everybody here 
agrees that we want to ensure that those are, in, are, are protected. Nothing, that's gotta be number one. Nothing works if we can't ensure that our, that our staff are, uh, are, are, have the things that they need, that we're able to attract people, that we're able to fill our schools with the people who make it run. I think you know, everybody agrees on that. That's uh, the lion's share of that 255 million that I'm talking about. That's 201.5 million dollars. We then have state required accelerators. That's eight and a half million dollars. So that is stuff that we need to pay for in order to, uh, that's blueprint stuff, it's required by the blueprint. So there's no debate there, eight and a half million dollars. Um, then there is the staffing to, uh, to cover increased enrollment. If we don't cover that, then we're just having more students come without hiring up more staff. That's larger class sizes. That is a formula calculation. Um, and that is, am I correct, that's a formula calculation there. And that is $21 million. And I actually know that those, that those projections are actually, we're seeing that those, that's actually smaller than it needs to be, but let's, for the sake of ease, let's just say that's $21 million. Um, and then inflation is the other number that's there. That's $24 million. Um, so, and that's again before we get to the non-state required accelerators, which that's another $38.5 million. But the point is that, you know, as, as colleagues and, uh, you know, have said, surely there can be another, you know, $22 million that can be found, you know, which is the difference between um, what uh, Chair Jawando has put forward and, and which I seconded, uh, and the um, floor that the committee put through, you know, surely there's another 22 million dollars that can be found. And I, and I think there's an understanding up here that that's a reference to, we've got to be looking at the base budget for that because it's, ju it's just not here in the, in, the, in the other stuff that I've just described. There's a little bit of flex in the non-state required accelerators, um, but considering we're already coming in at, at either of those price points, we're already coming in way below what's needed for that. So what I have realized in the course of having these conversations is that you know, I'm hearing things from colleagues about, well, surely there's money in ESSER funds, right? We can repurpose some stuff with ESSER funds. That is a completely reasonable, we should absolutely be having that conversation. And we're having that conversation as we look at other budgets, right? Where, where can we use other sources of funding, whether it's state or federal? We, that is a fiscally responsible thing to do as we are making these decisions. I think that's an excellent point and question, and we want, your, you know, we want input on that. And I think, you know, we've talked about that in committee, but it's clear that our colleagues are needing that level of detail, and I really deeply appreciate and respect that um, because this is a big decision about you know, the biggest part of our county funding. If there is one area of funding where we, sh we should not be just skipping over those in the weeds conversations, this is it. Especially if we're gonna skip over it and say, I'm sure the money is there, let's, let's go a little lower. I, I, don't, I don't think that it would be responsible of us to do that. And when, what I'm hearing again in these conversations is that folks don't want to, they would like answers to those questions. And I think it has felt like uh, a lack of transparency, but the, the information is there. So um, I think we should talk about it. And then it's again, not, also not just ESSER funding because that's for one-time costs. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are not one-time costs. So when we're looking at how much of a, of a cut to the request, can MCPS absorb? We have to look at the base budget in order to answer that question. And historically, I know the council has allowed you to just do that independently, and we've said that you all can figure it out, and that's what you have done. But when I hear that the reason for going lower than where, you know, my, my opinion is that I, that I, having looked at the numbers myself, that I think we should, if the reason is because cuts can be made to the base budget, I think we have to actually look at that, and you need to have a chance to respond to that and to talk about that. And I ask for your partnership in, if there are areas in the base budget where you're like, I would rather we not be cutting that, but if we had to, we could sustain that for a little while with the, you know, with an eye to, in future, hopefully we could fund that back up because things will run better with those, with those things. But what we want to ensure here is that we are not making cuts that are going to make our schools worse. I, we cannot explain that to the public. Things are in a, in a bad way right now. I think we all see, and nobody wants that, right? We're, we are bleeding staff. Parents are not happy. We are not uh, providing all the special ed services that we need to provide we're, and, and want to provide. Um, we're, we're hurting. And if we um, make the wrong decision here because we didn't get into the weeds, because we didn't take the time to really dive in and understand things that folks are trying to make our decisions based around, 
Um, I don't know how to explain that in the, in the coming year. And I don't want us to be in that position. So I have brought Council the member, yes. your 10 minutes is up. OK. Would anybody like to share their time with me so that I may? Um, I'm going to give out this information, and, and then I'd like to let folks respond. Your 10 minutes is up. I mean, you, can, you can get back in the queue. OK. Those I'll were the ground rules that we, oh, okay. that we set. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll get back in the queue then. Very good. Uh, Council Member Albernaz. Okay, so thank you everybody. And again, apologies for not being there in person. I agree with um, Councilmember Mink's comments about this being an especially emotional week. And to Dr. McKnight, of course we think all of our children are high priority. <laughs> and so uh, the insinuation that by making difficult budget decisions that somehow they aren't is disingenuous. And uh, I'll just say that uh, I appreciated the multiple committee sessions that we had within the Education and Culture Committee. I appreciate all of the committee sessions that we have had across county government uh, as we're trying our best to address the needs of our entire county population who has been devastated by what has transpired these last three years, but especially our children, youth, and families. We all acknowledge that. And we're seeing evidence of that in the need for uh, the insecurities with regards to food, um, in the need for additional mental health services across the board, uh, the challenges that our aging population is facing right now, or developmental disability population is facing right now, our especially vulnerable populations have just taken it on the chin uh, over these last several years. And we're doing our best to balance the needs of an entire county with the fiscal reality that's staring us straight in the face. And I mentioned it earlier, but if nothing changes, um, the decision to downsize county government is gonna be made for all of us. And I'll remind colleagues that literally the first order of business that the 19th council took um, was having to go through a mid-year savings plan. And there was a time in the not too recent past in which 11 of 13 fiscal years started with a reduction or in addition to that had a savings plan associated with it. And so we have to look at the totality of the affordability of the entire budget that we are passing. And the process that we are going through with MCPS is no different than we are with executive branch agencies. The difference as has been noted is the council is not in a position to be able to follow up to hold to, to have further and in more in-depth conversations about how exactly those operating budgets are spent throughout the course of the fiscal year. And I'll just note that if you add the 80 million that was added in above MOE last year to the 156 that's being proposed now um, in the seven tranches, that equates to 80% of the total tax supported operating budget of the Department of Health and Human Services. And so we're talking about really significant increases because we acknowledge they are necessary right now. And the superintendent and the president of the board made very compelling arguments for the need for these additional accelerators. And all of us are united in making the highest possible priority, ensuring that we fulfill our obligation in salary and compensation uh, for our teachers and support staff and administrators at MCPS, who we know have been just performing heroically these last couple of years. But we also have to think about the next two operating budgets and what comes before us. Dr. McKnight noted that they are likely to come back next year with an ask on top of this ask. Uh, and my concern is, is that if we don't, as I said again earlier, make difficult decisions now, and if reductions are gonna to have to be made in county government, they're gonna be made in everything else, not in MCPS. And there are incredibly important services across the board that support the children and youth that are in those classrooms. So this, this, this all or nothing um, discussion ha has been really challenging. Uh, and I think that uh, has put us all in, in an incredibly difficult and an enviable position. And again, we're all gonna be here again next year. So I appreciate the comments from colleagues and I acknowledge the challenges before us. I think the committee recommendation was reasonable. 
um, you know, given the circumstances that we find ourselves right. in right now. And as was noted by Councilmember Mink, there are uh, different levers that MCPS has to pull right now that are unique and that are important. So with that, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Albernaz, for highlighting um, the, the action being taken, which is not cutting the budget. It is a question of after giving $117 million above MOE last year, how much above how much additional can we add now, given the fiscal landscape that we are in? And as the committee took up and recommended with the seven cent funding level, if you will, and um, I wanted to just confirm with Ms. McGuire that even at the seven cent level with those tranches added, um, that there is ample funding to support the contracts at issue. Is that correct? In the full tax supported budget, that's correct. Correct. Okay. Um, this has been a rough conversation, and I'm not going to lie, my trust has been broken tremendously in the way things have been handled. Um, and MCPS is really important to me, not just because I am passionate about education and education policy, but because my four kids attend your schools. Um, and I believe we need to provide the level of funding that does, in fact, increase salary for our teachers, our school staff, our administrators. It's important especially because of the challenges we faced in the last few years and all the adapting and creativity that needed to be put into place to manage through the pandemic and keep our kids educated to the best of their abilities, often with parents not behaving very well during those circumstances. I had often said when I would teach about school law at the state that I think that 26101A of the education article about disrupting schools applies mostly and is suitable mostly for parents who go into the front office enraged. Um, but I'm disappointed because it's a disservice to the teachers who understandably feel anxious about this issue and to their school staff about thinking that their collective bargaining process has, in my view, been used to make us the villains in this process and stoke anxiety and create a very false impression that is up to the county council as to whether or not their contracts get funded. When no matter how hard we all collectively tried to convey that we would never jeopardize the funding to support those contracts, but that ultimately the decision was up to you, we were told that was incorrect and that if we did not give everything you asked for, you would not fund their contracts. Um, that's the responsibility of MCPS central office with you at the helm, and that is the responsible the responsibility of our Board of Education with you at the helm. And I agree 100% that there's a lot that needs to be done to enhance a collaborative and productive relationship because, again, trust has been broken. and. I think it's really important because this is the most essential public service our county provides. Um, so I support the original recommendation of the committee because I believe that level of funding provides MCPS the funding it needs to honor the contracts while addressing the most pressing and urgent and required programmatic enhancements. It gives the school system an additional 156 million over this year's budget, providing the flexibility needed to make reasonable, rational, and relatively small adjustments to make their budget more efficient, just as we, and you've heard us this morning, have been asking every single department to do so that we are not overburdening our residents. Um, but I want to talk to you as a mom. Um, there's been much ado made about transparency. And two things that are critically important to me are transparency and fidelity. Um, and that means fidelity to following your own policies and procedures because that hasn't happened. Um, I'll give you an example. The grading policy, there's a due date and a deadline date. And students get 50% credit just for being enrolled in the class, right? Those due dates and deadline dates, I have not seen one of my four children's classes for this entire year or the prior school year enforced. Nobody has enforced them. And you talked about the importance of being data-driven. 
but the data is not really accurate if nobody's really holding the students accountable to the policies that you put in place that would in fact affect the data and the outcomes to see whether the students were making personal growth or not. Because at the end of the day, while it may be data driven, it is human centered and we need to be focusing on the children and need to make sure, as was noted in your op-ed, the board's op-ed, that we are preparing our students for success in life. And if they exit MCPS schools feeling like a deadline doesn't ever mean anything at all, what service have we done them? Um, I also think it's incredibly important to focus on compliance and compliance with state laws. And I know in the education arena, you all have a very large bucket of state laws to comply with. Um, but that always hasn't happened. For example, during the 2021-2022 school year, there are around 100 school security employees who worked in those buildings all year long who had never been trained in the state's mandatory curriculum for school security employees. And I know that there are about 40 now who haven't been trained, and I know you want to add more. What's going to be done to make sure they are actually trained before they are working in the school building? Because again, our teachers deserve a safe school environment. Our students deserve a safe school environment. That needs to be addressed. Um, and you know, it's important to make sure that we are better supporting our students in the classroom, as you said earlier. And that means making sure that the maximum amount of the funding allocated to MCPS benefits directly the students in the classroom. Because we've heard in my office repeatedly about students who are not receiving the paraeducators they are supposed to have. They are not receiving the supports they're supposed to have. And so that's a specific problem related to the employees that should have been hired, should have been managed. And this is a management issue. Teachers complain about the fact that they don't have time to plan because they're too busy covering other classes. And at the beginning of the last school year, there was a big public campaign to try to get the school system to pay their bus drivers just a couple dollars more to make sure they say you had plenty of money in the budget to do that but it took a level of public prodding and pushing to get there rather than proactively making the choices to do the right things so for those reasons um, I just wanted you to know that yes collectively we are watching and we do have high expectations for this school system wholly accepting and recognizing that it is a large school system and that it is complex to manage, but that at the end of the day, we all have to make difficult choices and we would not do anything that would jeopardize your ability to fully fund those contracts. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Thank President, you. may I respond to one aspect uh, of that, please? Not unless she wants to yield to you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Sales. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank uh, Chair Jawando and the Education and Culture Committee's um, leadership and hard work in shepherding us through um, half of the county's operating budget. I also want to thank Essie McGuire for putting together a thorough packet and for the panelists that have joined us today. And I will probably won't take up uh, the rest of the entire time, so whoever uh, wants to take the remaining, I'll allow. Um, we have heard from our educators who are frustrated and want compensation for the difficult job, especially post-pandemic. We have also heard from constituents unhappy about the tax burden that doesn't result in accolades for their students who must take remedial classes when they advance to Montgomery College. This budget has been incredibly challenging, trying to meet the real needs of our county residents with dwindling revenue streams. Um, we have to balance the needs of our schools and students while making manageable financial decisions for our residents. As a homeowner, a fellow educator, and a parent of an MCPS graduate, I share your concerns about the tax burden we're asking our residents to shoulder with us, especially for our older adults and low-income families. 
Nonetheless, I support a budget that funds our employee contracts and resolves our looming structural deficit next year. We must work proactively and intentionally to expand our tax base and show that we are serious about not relying on property tax increases to fund our needs. We must also look at attracting state and federal government resources more competitively. Moving forward, I will be convening substantive conversations about effective oversight, accountability, and structural reforms, allowing us to look hard at existing resources and opportunities for restructuring programs to meet our needs in a post-COVID and ever-changing world. Our budgetary decisions are an opportunity for shared accountability and fiscal oversight and an opportunity for all of us to work collaboratively as a team for our educators, our residents, and most importantly, our students. We all agree who are at the core of all of the decisions and our greatest hope of achieving the highest ideals deserving of a 21st century economy. As stated previously, and by all of my colleagues, we also need to work with our agencies, unions, and especially MCPS in a manner that is respectful, transparent, dignified, and deserving of the highest level of commitment, considering the seriousness and anxieties of these consequential decisions. Under the circumstances that we find ourselves and knowing that the council staff is still reviewing the financial landscape, I believe that the education and culture's original recommendations of the school system's budget are an opportunity to meet our contractual needs and allow the taxpayers some savings from the county executive's recommended initial budget. However, in light of council member Mink's passionate testimony, I would be willing to hear from staff and anyone else who can speak to the um, stated um, gap of the seven tranches and funding the contracts, which I believe are 215 million, but it looks like there's only 201 million with the seven tranches. So just want to make sure that what what the difference is and I'll let Essie respond thank you I'll just briefly clarify the numbers um, <clears throat> so under the seven tranches the county contribution would increase by 150 156.4 million the total tax supported which includes increases in state aid and other tax supported resources and again we talk about tax supported as that sort of the fungible part of the budget because it excludes specific grants with specific priorities so the fy24 tax supported funding at that level would be the 215.7 the board's original budget did indicate a compensation placeholder of 201.5 million so the 201.5 then is uh, approximately 14 million below that uh, tax supported recommendation of the seven increments. So that would be that 14 million then would be available to, excuse me, to allocate to any other priorities, as well as again, adjustments um, that might need to, that would need to be made in addition. Okay. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you for the, the question as well. And I, re I want to just start by saying I really do uh, understand and respect the difficult decisions that are before this body today. Uh, we make many of them internally as the COO. Um, I am often responsible for making some of those difficult decisions. So I just wanted to circle back to um, the, the uh, previous council members' comments around the contract and what would be affordable under what we're calling these seven increments. Mm -hmm. So the seven increments would leave uh, a gap between the board approved budget uh, and the council approved budget of $74.4 million. Mm. So even if we eliminated all of the non-required, non-blueprint required accelerators, that still leaves a gap of $40 million. So $40 million is not something that we can find in the couch cushions. It's not something that we can find in central office. It is not something that we have the ability to close at that magnitude without either cuts to the schools 80% of our budget goes directly to schools. 
So without touching the classroom or without renegotiating the contracts, uh, we do not see a way of closing a $40 million gap. Uh, as I said, 80% of our uh, budget goes directly to the schools. The remaining amount provides uh, critical uh, services such as transportation, maintenance, uh, building services to the people who keep our buildings clean, uh, the people who keep our students safe every day. And so these are not nice to haves. These are critical uh, services that are provided to our students. And so even with the reduction of the accelerators, which include the math coaches, the English learner teachers, uh, along with the security guards that we have put forward that we need because of increased enrollment and in increased square footage within our schools, all of that would be eliminated, still leaving a $40 million gap. And I'll just finally note that, well, I know that there has been a lot of talk about the school system can find this, the school system can find uh, the, the money to close this gap, whether it's in blog posts or in the staff recommendation, but nobody has offered up a solution to closing that gap because there is not a good solution without impacting our teachers and our students. Thank you. Did anyone else want to respond? I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sales, Councilmember Stewart. Great. Thank you all um, very much for being here. Um, I thank the superintendent, Dr. McKnight, for all your work. Um, the school board, um, the council staff, and everyone. Um, and congratulations on the, the contracts. Uh, and getting those done. Um, so uh, this may be my first county budget, but I've done a lot of budgets in my life <laughs> um, as a nonprofit executive, a business owner, many as a mayor, and um, as a parent as well. And I want, want to share how I approach budgets and how I got to my decision for today. Um, generally, I ask myself, how do we best address the needs we have today and prepare for tomorrow? And it's said, and we've said here today, that budgets are a reflection of our values, and they are. And it's also true that if we don't find the correct balance of meeting the needs in the short term and planning for the future, we fail. And the actions we take here are not in isolation. What we do today impacts tomorrow. What we do today here, as I think Council Member Albanaz said very well, impacts what we're doing later this afternoon and what will impact what we do next week when we set our final budget. And that's why I want to take a moment and return to an action that this body took a few days ago when we passed a recordation tax. Because it was historic and I don't think it's actually been acknowledged enough to be said that this body entered into a conversation on Tuesday not whether or not we would increase the recommendation tax to fill the gap in our infrastructure project, specifically on school funding, but by how much we would do it. There was a real recognition by this body that we needed to address the shortcomings because we have schools in great needs. And we understand those are places of education for our students and their workplaces for teachers and staff. And we needed to address that ASAP, and we did. And we did it to address the short-term need as well as look forward to the future. And it was a balance. And I want to thank my colleagues here because we had a very respectful, thoughtful conversation on where to hit that. Where did we need to hit that? And I just want to say thank you because this afternoon we're going to talk about how much money we actually get to save in our operating budget <laughs> because of where we set that. And I think it was really important. And so today we are talking about increases to our school budget. And we understand what the need is. And we need to think about how much can we increase to address the short term while we keep our eye on the long term and plan for our future. And that's really very important for us today. And I want to come back to being a parent um, and just really, regardless of how we end up today, and m make sure, as Council Member Mink said, that each of us, as parents, as I have had two children who went through MCPS and they received an excellent education. But for me, more importantly, 
was the support they received from the educators they had and the staff they had. Because my children would not be the children today who are succeeding without that. And that's, I, I deeply believe that. And my son graduates next weekend. That's why I'm wearing a mask today, because I am not getting COVID <laughs> um, in the next week. And he's going to go on to graduate school and then be a teacher. And I truly believe it's because of the teachers he had here at MCPS. And it's so important. So I want you to know I carry all this with me as I make decisions about the budget, the overall budget, not just MCPS. And these are really difficult decisions to make. And the idea of the challenges we face of looking at individual departments, MCPS, which is more than half of our budget, as the council president said, and piecing all these things together and really thinking about what is the balance we can strike. And so today, I will say that I am going to support the original recommendation from the committee and the seven increments. I believe that this will fund what we need, the increases we need. And I know it is ultimately up to MCPS and the school board to make determinations, but I want to emphasize that the priority that needs to be put on, on fully funding the contracts for our teachers and staff. That needs to be front and center. Because if we are going to address the short-term needs and the long-term needs, for me, that is the top priority. And again, I thank you for all your work. I know we may not completely agree on everything, but I appreciate the dialogue and the continued dialogue we'll have. I yield back my time. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, let me start out by thanking the Education and Cultural Committee for doing a very difficult job during a very difficult time. Um, and I want to publicly thank uh, S.E. McGuire from county staff uh, for working through a $3 billion plus budget. Not easy. And I also want to thank the Board of Education and you, Madam Superintendent, and all the other educators for doing what you do. You don't get enough thanks, and we're appreciative of that. And it seems like we're on different sides of a table at this point. I guess figuratively are on different sides of a table, and we really are not. It's how do we come together to get this accomplished? And this is not an easy task. I'm a product of Montgomery County Public Schools, <clears throat> excuse me, as was my mother. My wife worked for Montgomery County Public Schools for 40 years. My daughter still works there. And I can tell you no one thinks more of Montgomery County Public Schools than I do in my, in my family. And you mentioned that every student is a high priority. Absolutely every student is a high priority. And, it, and it's throughout Montgomery County. But I started out this budget process, and I've done budgets for, um, uh, for a while, and I said that this was the worst doggone budget I've ever dealt with, and this one is. This one is horrible, because we have to deal with so many moving parts. And then, of course, we're, there's the possibility of, of, a, of a tax increase, which is never applauded, uh, except for, for in some in some areas it might be applauded. It's not applauded throughout Montgomery County. But we are getting through this. But when I first started, I, my goal, my thought, was that we have to have enough funds in this budget to fund every collective bargained agreement, every one, from the county side. And it gets confusing to the public, but your collective bargain agreement is, though it's paid for by county funds, it's not the county's collective bargain agreement. And, and I, thought, I believe that that is extremely necessary. I believe that should be the first cost of everything we do, everything we do. I also believe that if our children are hurting, that we need to have the accelerators. We need to get our children back on track. Now, from what I understand from uh, and I'm not on Education and Culture Committee, and, and at times I'm glad I'm not, might I add, but, but um, I, it is my understanding that there, are, uh, it would be enough from the seven tranches, that there would be enough for the, to fund every collective bargained agreement, plus there's $15 million left 
which you need about 10 million. We're, we're dealing, in, you know, may, figures may be here, but about 10 million for the accelerators. So you could fund those if you did that first. It's also, and I'm going to turn over to uh, turn my uh, time over to Ms. McGuire. It's also my understanding that that we have the possibility, and, I, and it was alluded to earlier, about the uh, ESSER funds and the reserves that would not necessarily affect this budget. Can you explain that, please, Ms. McGuire? Yes, and let me first clarify. I believe, Mr. Katz, when you're referring to the 10 million of accelerators, I believe you're referring to sort of the ones that appear to be associated with the math and literacy. There yeah, are math and literacy in those numbers. Because yes. the, the total number of accelerators is larger. I just want to acknowledge yeah, and, that. And I appreciate it. Um, thank you. And Ms. McGuire, that's why you keep us on the straight and narrow. That is exactly what I was talking about. Thank you. So that, that is the, uh, again, that's the number associated with the accelerators for math and literacy. Regarding the um, federal ESSER funds, the school system does have at this time, as of their last report, nearly $140 million of ESSER funding that is unexpended and unencumbered. Now, certainly the school system has allocated those funds in terms of identifying potential future uses for those funds. However, because they are unspent and unencumbered, they are available to be realigned and repurposed for any eligible purpose under the ESSER funding. ESSER funding purposes are broad. Um, and again, as has been discussed, we certainly have had similar conversations in county government regarding the federal funding and the county government as well. And so that would be a resource to be able to um, begin to integrate into the school system's budget. And uh, again, we have one year left. The system has one year left on those funds that they do uh, need to be spent by the end of September 2024. So that would be over the course of the next year to begin to integrate those into the And that budget. number again was? $140 million. You know, I believe that we, if we sat down as a family, if we sat down as a community, we could figure out how to spend those those dollars to get us to where we need to be and still do with exactly what I'm asking about and, and many other colleagues are asking. I don't believe we would affect um, the, the, uh, the uh, collective bargained agreements by doing it that way. I believe we can get there, but I believe we need to you know, roll up our sleeves and, and have those discussions. I can tell you uh, 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 from the Board of Education, we've had more than any four <laughs> discussions about how we're, how we're going to get there. This, this is a terribly difficult budget, and we need everyone working together to get us to that better place. And I, I pledge to try to do that with you, that I think we all need to pledge that we're going to look at every funds that, that you have that we have without affecting the classroom, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can get to that better place. And with that, I yield back to you, Mr. Princeton. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Katz, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the conversation. Appreciate everybody being here. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have received a lot of calls and a lot of conversations from impassioned teachers and school professionals asking that the council fully fund their salaries. For me, that has not been a question. That has never been a question. We all recognize that there is a clear recruitment, retention, and morale challenge in our school system. Everybody agrees on that. Everybody wants to focus on that. And I believe that's why we all support fully funding the bargain agreements. I don't think that's ever been in question, and I don't believe that anybody here on this dais has ever suggested otherwise. Our school system has been working diligently to address the effects of the pandemic, and I really appreciate those efforts. Uh, it is not an easy time for public education, Madam Superintendent, as you noted. These are unique and unprecedented challenges, which I very much appreciate and respect. Uh, and I understand as part of that, there is an interest to try new initiatives to tackle these challenges with new uh, approaches. Uh, but I also think that it's important that we get the people right first. And the people are the teachers and the support staff uh, whose uh, agreements uh, have uh, moved forward. And I, I think it's uh, important, as I think we all believe, that uh, it's those people, our educators and support staff, are the backbone of the education system, and that they are the foundation. And the focus, first, second, and always, should be to 
uh, ensure that uh, the agreements uh, can be honored uh, and that we make sure that we get the people right first. I just want to make sure that that is noted. I think you've heard it from colleagues. I want to reiterate uh, it uh, myself. It is very clear to me as we talk about fiscal constraints and as we talk about the balance and we talk about the challenges that investments in those contracts will pay dividends. I know that putting money into the classroom to pay teachers more will help. I fun fundamentally believe that and I don't think there's any disagreement up here. I fundamentally believe that providing funding for paraeducators and special educators will help address the acute challenges that are in our schools. We have real recruitment and retention challenges. We have more people who are leaving this profession that are entering it and that are, are studying uh, in, in, in schools to, to go into it. And that is a massive problem, not unique to Montgomery County. But that will affect Montgomery County as a place that has valued and has been built up in many ways uh, on uh, our strength of our public education system, including me and most of us up here who are products of, of Montgomery, Montgomery County Public Schools. It's less clear the other programs, the other choices, the other decisions that we are addressing. Not all of them are positive. All of them are intended to help address the many challenges in our schools, but they are less well understood of exactly what the return on investment will be, how we will understand and, and, and hold accountable uh, to whether or not they're actually making an acute difference in addressing these massive unprecedented challenges that we face in dealing with issues that didn't start with the pandemic, but were exacerbated overwhelmingly, unprecedentedly by uh, the pandemic. And so I appreciate colleagues, I appreciate the work uh, that the Education and Culture Committee has done. I appreciate the, the school system's work. I appreciate Ms. McGuire, who, who knows a thing or two about uh, the MCPS uh, budget. Uh, for putting forward some options and really thinking uh, through this. Um, and I am going to support the committee recommendation that the council staff, who, who knows quite a bit about the school budget, uh, has made clear will be able to cover the contracts. And I want to make very clear that it is my expectation, and I think you've heard from other colleagues' expectation, that that is the intention of the increase. We're going well over maintenance of effort. We're providing significant additional funding. It may not be all that the system is requesting, but I am going to the level that we are going because I want it to cover the contracts. I want it to go to teachers and to support staff. And so I want to make that uh, very clear. Uh, and I'll just close um, this conversation and, and it's been referenced here a little bit, uh, at times has gotten pretty divisive and, and even destructive. And I find it disappointing and unhelpful. And I just hope as we move forward, and I believe we have begun this process today, and I am hopeful and optimistic about that, that we can, despite all of our incredible passion for public education, for students, for teachers, for the work that is happening in the classroom that our teachers are facing challenges they have never faced before, have jobs that are harder than our jobs, harder than my job, that we talk about these issues in a way that models behavior that we would expect of our kids. And I just, I just, I just want to note that and I appreciate that and I really appreciate all of the passion, I appreciate all of the hard work. I appreciate all of the efforts that have gone into this recommendation. And with that, Mr. President, I'll yield back. Thank you, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Um, I do yet. <laughs> uh, good morning. I appreciate all the hard work the Board of Education and CPS leadership, frontline teachers, paraeducators do on behalf of our children. As you know, I have two children in MCPS. So I'm committed to the success of Montgomery County Public Schools, not only on behalf of my constituents, but also on behalf of my own children, who love their teacher, by the way. However, overshadowing this whole discussion about pay raises, working conditions, and the finer details of NCPS budget are the results in the classroom. I'd like to focus on third grade reading. 
And let me remind you, I'm not talking to you as an elected official. I'm talking to you as a mom of two young kids in elementary schools within MCPS and with lots of friends and neighbors with kids in MCPS. The pandemic had devastating effects on learning. The poor data on third grade reading goes back years. The latest data presented to the Board of Education in March of this year shows literacy in third grade for black and brown students, showing that only up to 32% of those students meet the standards for literacy. We are failing our children. Let me make that clear. I'm looking at schools in my district and the data is shameful. At Arcola Elementary, it's 22%. Pierce Mill, 34%. Glen Ellen, 35%. Ken Mill, my home school, 17% to highlight a few schools in my district. I know you're committed to getting our kids to read at grade level by the end of third grade, because we all know that failure to read at grade level at the end of third grade sets our kids on path where they will not be success successful, depriving them on our community on what they can achieve. This is a high priority of the Black and Brown Coalition that I'm proud of uh, attending meetings and I'm sure a priority of all of you on the Board of Education and, as, and us as on the County Council. I appreciate that this difficult problem to solve, but, but what I want to know is what are we doing about it? The answer can be to shrug our shoulders and hand wave at some programs and say, we will try harder next year. That's what I got when I had that joint committee session between Econ and Education Committee. I need to see results. With data, during my first session as chair of the Economic Development Committee, I talked about no the November 22 data on literacy and math. I did that because making sure young children are fully prepared by third grade is part of having a strong future workforce. I called for a joint session between my committee and education and culture to talk about this, and the presentation from MCPS was highly disappointing. There's a strong difference from highlighting a couple of programs, particularly for high school and middle school, versus showing results. That lead to closing the achievement gap, which you are not doing. New York City just announced that they are unveiling a new curriculum based on emerging research into the science of reading. That's a district that is thinking outside the box. I know that you had a literacy pilot program in East Silver Spring and then additional eight schools to provide more support for teachers and paraeducators in the classroom. And the results were promising. I have not been able to find the results of that work on the additional eight schools, including Glen Allen, which is in my district, and I would love to have that data, especially if you claim that you're transparent. I also know that you recently approved a contract with a vendor for that same purpose. I know that the Board of Education makes a final determination on how the money is to be spent once the council finalizes the budget. That's not a role, but we on the council have a responsibility to discuss specifics and ask the Board of Education to focus on the key programs for success. MCPS budget is half of the operating budget and people, constituents, are also asking for transparency in that process. So I have a couple of questions and I request in this contract with this new vendor, the main tool for addressing third grade literacy, what is it? Are all the 35 Title I schools and MCPS going to be benefiting from this? Uh, and since we promote third, third graders to the fourth grade, whether they can read at grade level or not, would you commit to expanding this effort next year to all Title I schools focused on third grade reading achievement? This is a new council and I want us to work together because we all care about the same, making sure our children are successful in school and that our teachers and staff are compensated with contracts that reflect the negotiations by the teachers union. Okay, I'm a pro-union person. Like that's something I will never touch when it deals with contracts. Um, and I will say since many of these Title I uh, schools are in my district, I look forward to working directly with our elected Board of Education members, MCPS leadership, and the Brackenbrown 
coalition throughout the year to track results with the emphasis in third grade. With that, I fully agree with the Education and Culture Committee recommendation. And I don't need a back and forth right now because I gave you the opportunity a few months ago and it was not given to me. And I will not ask for another joint Education Committee because it was, I wanna, as a district council member, I will directly ask you for those results because we are failing, especially the black and brown kids in my district. That's all, I yield back uh, my time to the council president. Thank you, council member. Uh, next, council member Balcom. Um, thank you. Hold on. Um, so, thank you all. I know this is a difficult conversation. Uh, and as Council Member Mink started hours ago, maybe, <laughs> um, we all do care about our school system and are invested in our school system. And uh, I know that the system is in dire needs. Um, I've visited schools. I started out this term visiting schools, and I understand that. Um, and I appreciate the ENC's committee uh, for taking the deep dive into the budget. Of course, our staff and Council Member Meek's um, deep dive in the past 24 hours into the budget. Um, and I, I, I know the numbers, I've looked at the numbers, but somebody has to pay for it. Our residents are asking, are, have to pay for it, including our teachers through the tax increase. I appreciate um, Superintendent uh, comment that her job, your job, is to advocate for our children every single day. I appreciate that. My job is to make sure that we fund our teachers. We need to make sure that we fund not only our school system, but our public safety. Uh, we need to fund our HHS, our strong safety net. We need to feed and house our most vulnerable population. We also need to fund our environmental needs, our libraries, and all the other things that the government does. My job is to make sure that, that we have the funds to do it, all of it. Uh, we are facing a 10% tax increase this year, and without any changes to the base budget, there will be an additional 7% increase next year. Even if the school system comes back with 0% increase, we have a structural deficit, and the year after that, and the year after that. And throughout this conversation, I have been very clear with everyone that I've spoken to that creating this structural deficit is, a, is fiscally irresponsible and I cannot support a budget that continues to dig a deep hole. At the beginning of the budget discussion, I asked the county executive staff, the OMB staff, how we would address the structural deficit that was presented to us and the response was that we would have that discussion next year. That's just not acceptable. I'm not an educator, and I would never presume to tell a teacher or the school administrators how to do their job. But I do know a lot about our economy and the uh, precarious balance uh, to fund our needs versus placing additional burdens on individuals uh, that, that may or may not be able to bear it. A significant tax increase affects everyone, including people who may not have the, main, the means to make ends meet. We've heard a lot from our residents who um, cannot and will not be able to pay for this increase in taxes, including our, many of our seniors and vulnerable population. Um, the property tax uh, impact will impact uh, small businesses who also had a very difficult time in the past couple of years and are on the margin. They, some of them will not be able to pay the increase in property tax. Um, or it will impact our large employers who may decide not to come here if the property tax is too high. I want to be very clear about this statement. This does not mean that the economy is more important than our students, quite the opposite. We cannot fund anything anything in our budget without a robust economy. Uh, but we also need to look at the cost of housing. One of the most critical issues we face, the most complex issue we face, is uh, the housing affordability crisis. Uh, and part of the reasons we need to pay our teachers more is because we want them to live in our communities and we want them to be able to afford housing. We cannot continue to make housing uh, more costly. Um, 
I understand the frustration of this discussion, and I understand the dire needs. Uh, we need to, fi to find the right balance. We had a very difficult discussion with the CAO this morning about the, uh, the county government's responsibility to find efficiencies, uh, and we're not done. We're, we, you know, we've got another week to go on this. Um, given where we are, I'm supporting the original recommendation for the, from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll share my thoughts uh, now that you've heard the thoughts of all of my colleagues. What you've heard is we are united in supporting the contracts. Just as we supported county contracts last week, unanimously, you have heard all of us unanimously state our intention to support our contracts to ensure that our hardworking teachers, paraeducators, principals, administrators, everybody gets the support that they need. And the recommendation made by the Education and Culture Committee provides even more funds above our contracts. I will be supporting the Education and Culture's original committee recommendation that just last week was unanimous. And I think it's important to recognize that we just had a conversation, as has been noted, with the Chief Administrative Officer talking about updating, reforming our county government so that we could use those funds to support essential services. And I'll share with you some of those essential services that we are finding funds and savings for is going to help our schools. This has been a very complex conversation. Not only complex in the council, complex within MCPS, but complex for the community. Because what was presented to us by the county executive was that MCPS can only be funded with a 10% tax increase. That's not true. What was being proposed were more than $200 million that were being generated from a 10% tax increase. But what you've been seeing this council do over the last month is find savings in other areas so that we could use those resources in places that need them. The county executive offered, suggested creating hundreds of jobs when we have 1,200 to 1,500 vacancies. So rather than trying to create new jobs and backfill the ones that are vacant, we just had a conversation about saving $8 million. That was a unanimous decision on this council. And where's those $8 million going to go? I have a suggestion. I think they should go to our schools. Thus, we don't necessarily need the tax increase that the county executive proposed. This has been a complex conversation. It has been the most transparent process this council has undertaken as long as I have been following county government. Because a 10% property tax increase, a $6.8 billion, $6 billion budget requires transparency. And the oversight that we have been doing with county government, all of us are simply asking to be done at MCPS. I'm a former journalist. I like asking questions. And more so than asking questions, I like getting answers. And before any of us move to increase revenue, we want explanations. We want justifications. We want details. And so that is the place in which all of us are coming from. And. That's why I wrote a piece yesterday saying that MCPS is following the law. I think we need to update the law. I think we need, in Annapolis, our leaders to recognize that the budgets, not only in county government, but in school systems, have gotten even more complex. Our teachers deserve answers. Council members deserve answers, and taxpayers deserve answers. That's the only way we're going to improve ourselves, by taking a look at the data 
follow where the money is going. That's transparency. And I will say again, I will support, as this budget process moves forward, revenue increases to support MCPS. There's no doubt about that. But these are complex decisions. And when I talk about reforms as well, I'm originally from New York. And in New York, they have different ways of doing things. But one of the things that's empowered in New York are school boards are the ones who raise revenue within their districts. And so before they raise revenue, they're going through the budget. They're making decisions about what they think their community wants and can support. And we have a different system here, and it has its benefits. We're able to raise revenue throughout the county and spread it throughout the county. I think that's a beautiful thing. But it's bifurcated, where the superintendent makes a request, the school board makes a request, the county executive makes a request, and then it comes to the council. And after we write a check, <clears throat> There's no follow-up, and it comes back to communication. And very much like the chief administrative officer pledged to communicate more, recognizing that there's room for improvement, I hope to communicate more with you, Dr. McKnight, and you, President Silvestre. We all deserve it. Our kids deserve it. That's the only way we're going to improve by having these conversations, not necessarily on the dais, the day we're gonna decide the budget. But make no mistake about it, what you are hearing from this body is we will be supporting, but this is a tough budget. And just as we have not been able to fully fund every aspect of county government, unfortunately, that will likely be the case here. But I would like to think that a $215 million addition is not glossed over. And the revenue that will be required to fund that should not be dismissed. But that's because for the last month, we've been doing the hard work of asking questions, going through budgets, and getting answers from county government. And so I want to use this as an opportunity to reset our relationship so that as we start preparing for next year's budget, we have more communication in advance of it. Because our teachers, our paraeducators, our administrators, and most importantly, our kids deserve nothing less. And with that, I'll yield back and turn to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee. Thank you. And I appreciate the comments of my colleagues. Um, just wanted to make a couple of points that I didn't make at the beginning. Uh, and you know we have we did as I mentioned been in the job five months. I think this has been a different ENC committee than the last five years, last four years. We're going to continue to improve on the joint communication and how we review the budget. We've already talked to the board about some of these things about how in our respective elected responsibilities, us as the fiduciary, the board, and in, in the re responsible for the whole county budget. Uh, and how we set our agendas right at the board and at the committee and council to review more in more of a aligned way the same things at the same time to get the deep dive on the data. Uh, I think we've taken, not I think, I know we've taken steps towards that in the last several months. But also I think, there, and I know council member uh, Mink will go into this a little more, I just wanted to frame, there's no 10% tax increase on the table right now that's not that's been said it's it's not going to happen <laughs> it's not happening the committee recommendation was not on the tax increase because as been has been embedded in some of my colleagues comments our job was to recommend the level of funding for the school system which can come from multiple areas which has been also alluded to here uh, savings that we've made in other parts of the county budget etc certainly some of it has to come from the proposed tax increase because of the state law, but not all of it has to come from that. Um, and so the decision of the tax increase, what we made a recommendation was, just to be clear, I've heard everyone say they support the recommendation. The recommendation from the committee was nine tranches on the reconciliation list. 
seven as high priority, two as priority. There will be things that we all have acknowledged that are on priority that make it and things on high priority that don't make it or vice versa because it's all on the list. Today is not the decision of what those things are. Today is the, the, the amendment before the body is to increase from priority to high priority one of those tra nine tranches. That's the amendment. It doesn't change the committee recommendation in, in so far as it's still nine tranches that are on the reconciliation list. I just want to be clear about what the committee recommendation was. Um, now, the gap that was mentioned, and I do want to confirm this between the staff, what the level of cut would mean. You know, there's been ref reference to, well, you can find 22.3 million because that's the number of that we did actually remove in, in the committee. We said your fund balance was a little higher than we think it needs to. We're going to be your backstop. It was at 25 million. We said reduce that by 22.3 and, and gave the largest reduction because we're the largest part of the budget, so it makes sense, of any other committee, 22.3 million. Um, so that brought it down, and that's how we got to the nine tranches. Um, the gap, that was in addition to the request from the school system to the, to the county executive, which I think he only, he funded, was it 8 million difference? Is that right? Okay. So you sent a request to the county executive. He sent a request to us in the process that was mentioned. That reduced by 8 million your request. At the committee, we reduced that by another 22.3. So we're up to 30.3 million. That's been reduced from your request already. Uh, the proposal here and what you've made and I want to get clarity on this if you're only given seven tranches however it's given to you through property tax or cuts from other area if you're only given seven tranches of 22.3 million I heard you say and I want to confirm with our staff and in, in, in the school system that that would create a 74 million dollar gap what would, what would what was that number and what, what was that what did that include so um the 203 million that we've already talked about for compensation that I think everybody is in agreement is very important. Absolutely. But also equally important from the school district's perspective is $45 million in inflationary costs and costs for the 2,000 new students that we will be welcoming to MCPS next fall without funding because gas is going up, food is going up, sure. those costs are going up. We're getting the new students whether they're funded or not. So if that $45 million is not funded, it will it will mean cuts to the classroom. So in addition to the 200 million that all of the people in this room uh, want to see funded, we also need to account for what our children need and that requires an additional $45 million on that just to maintain the services we're providing today. Right, and so we all agree on the 203 million for the contracts, so the 45 million gets us that is 200 and it's a dangerous a lawyer doing math that's going to be 248 million right and so miss mcguire the seven tranches would fund how much <clears throat> the seven tranches in the total tax supported funding is the 215.7 million that's showing in your package. right 215 right so with just what we have to do based on the teacher contracts no flexibility there 203 million plus the 45 million for inflation, no flexibility on inflation. We all know that. We go to the gas pump, we go to the, the grocery store. And to receive the students, the 2,000 this year that came during the school year and the 2,000 plus more that are coming next year. We just talked about the immigration change that's happening imminently, which will absolutely pr produce more students here uh, that have significant challenges. Um, we'll get to that in a second. That's 248. The seven tranches only supports 215. Okay. And we haven't talked about my, my dear friend, my crying buddy here, Councilmember Katz, the 10 million for the accelerator for math and literacy, which is important to all of us, which funds people. I want to be clear that these accelerators fund people. They're, we said we want to support the people. The teachers that we want to fund need these people. They need the math coaches, they need the social workers. They need the security assistance that are funded in the accelerators. It's not just like nice to have things. We have to have these things in the budget. So we're at 248 without even talking about the math and literacy that the Black and Brown Coalition has begged us for, that $10 million. 
haven't even touched it. So let's add that on. Now we're at 258, uh, right? And we're only funding 215 is the what I'm hearing from uh, majority of colleagues. If we get to seven tranches, and there's an if there too, right? It has been said that we can use ESSER money to do it. And I know the school system's responsible. You probably would do that because those things I've just described and there's others that I haven't are have to happen. There's no, you know, we have to do the math and literacy. We have to do inflation. We have to do uh, the cost of new students. So if we move things to ESSER, that creates short and long-term problems. In the short term, it means you have to remove things off of the ESSER list that you've already allocated like tutoring, like, you know, social workers, things that were paid for through ESSER, the 40, the 40 plus social workers that are paid through, through ESSER. It makes you decide how you're gonna do that. And it creates a long-term problem because that money runs out next year. And things that are need to be built into the, the base budget will not be. And so that creates that issue. Then it's been suggested, well, you have money that you can find outside of that within the base budget. Let me just say, I agree. I'm sure there is some in a system that is this big. I don't think it's $75 million. If we would, none of us would be doing the right job, our jobs correctly, if there was that much money just lying around and no one could point to it. And I just wanna reiterate something you said that's been frustrating to me, and we will dig into this with the base budget review between this year and next year, working with the board in the system and with colleagues, but we're gonna do this on the NC committee. You have my commitment on that. No one's been able to say on our staff, on your staff, I understand why you can't, you can't say it because you're saying we don't have it, but where is that, where's that 75 million coming from? Where is the extra money? I'm not saying there's none, there's none but it's hard for me as the chair of ENC to do what I need to do for the students and families of this county to say, well, we think it's there. And we have, but we can't tell you where. That's difficult for me to, to swallow. And that's why we've made, I've made the, the motion to err on the side of giving you a little more in an unprecedented time and an unprecedented year where there's unprecedented need. Yes, fund our teachers, but let's give them the support with the social workers and the math coaches and the other things that they need in the classroom too. And yes, there's financial tr challenges, but we've underfunded education at the federal, state, and local level for a long time. And we are left, we are left with the hard decision here to make up for that. And it's a hard decision. And our, we're asking our community to step up, um, but we need to because our children's lives are at stake, our economy's at stake, all of it's at stake. So I would just ask colleagues to think about those numbers because they're not just made up numbers. Those are things that the school system has to do. And I just do not believe that they can find that in the, in the cushions underneath the school system. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Mink. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments of my colleagues. Um, and I, I, understand, I, have, I understand where this vote is going, obviously. Um, and, uh, and I know that it's not because anybody hates schools. I, I completely understand that. We are at a, a moment now where you have myself and, and uh, Chair Jawando saying, we're not sure, but we think it's, it's too much couch cushion money, we're erring on higher. And then we have the rest of the body saying, we're not sure, but we think that there is more couch cushion money. And so we're, you know, the, and, and you know, these, it, it's hard because we don't have the exact answers that we need. And if we did, this would be a whole lot easier. And, um, and, I, and I think it, something that, okay, I'm new here, I will just say. So I have learned a lot over this process. Uh, I've learned a lot over the last week. I've learned a lot over the last 24 hours. Um, yeah, and the, the first thing that I'm gonna do actually is I'm gonna withdraw my second on the, on the eight. I know that it's not going to, I understand that it's not going to pass. Um, however, I, and I, however, my cons and I also acknowledge that like, I don't know for sure what the number is either, that we're, we're all saying we're not sure and we're erring on different sides. And my tendency obviously is to, is to lean higher, but I understand priorities are what they are. People are gonna lean different directions. However, um, 
Everyone here has been united in saying we want to ensure the contracts are funded. We don't want to hurt classrooms, right? We, we have shared priorities here. And I think that is a part where that can be answered with information. And so uh, one of the things that I have learned over this uh, process of me digging in is that there is more information available that is actually publicly available um, that would help us to inform that conversation than has traditionally been discussed at the council. Because traditionally, this has been the purview of the Board of Education and MCPS. And so I think that there has been a lot of blaming um, and, and uh, or you know, frustration, let me not say blaming, but frustration um, directed at the Board of Education and at MCPS. Um, and I, I have felt frustration as well. But where I have come to is that I, I think what's happening now is that we are a different council with a different council president, with a different ENC committee, different ENC committee chair, with many different members. Um, we, we want more, we want to do things differently. Uh, we want more information. And we're also in a, a historic time in which we are facing tremendous budget pressures from all directions. And so that kind of scrutiny um, and making sure that, that we, as we make these decisions and that the public, as they see us make these decisions, we all want there to be that level of, of transparency. Um, and what I have seen, in, and so that said, the conversations that we have had um, in the committee have been you know, very different than have happened in, in times past. However, uh, we still, as a council, haven't, clearly haven't answered everybody's questions that we would need for everybody to be to say, we share these priorities and let's make sure they get done. And here is the number that is needed to do that. And with every other department that comes before us, you know, HHS comes before us, you know, fire comes before us. I just want to note, you know, how different the style of conversation is. And that is precedent and that is jurisdiction. And there's a lot of pieces to that. But um, it does make it difficult to know where to land on this because those conversations are so, are, are so different. When we go through every line item, we can see where the savings are and where they aren't, and we can haggle over those things. And so I think what we've seen here today is that um, uh, there is a desire and a, and a need to do that in order for us to be able to make uh, the types of budget decisions that we want to be able to make. So what I, to go back to what I was saying, what I have seen is that actually a lot of the information I think that we want to be able to make the types of decision making uh, to do the types of decision making it is available. And, um, and I've been reaching out to, to board members, to MCPS, um, to dig into the exact line items and talk about those sorts of things. And there has actually been a complete willingness to do so. Um, and so I apologize for not having those conversations earlier. But I, but I also think I have better come to understand from talking to my colleagues um, the level of detail that actually this new county council wants that, that previous councils haven't had and that we need to be able to make this decision. So um, I'm gonna, again, withdraw, I'm gonna withdraw my second, acknowledging also that we have left space in the committee recommendation for us to, as we come to the reconciliation table, um, not just with the school budget, but with everything, we've got a lot of stuff on high priority and, and, and on priority that's gonna have to get moved around. And we're going to have to be talking about how we want to do that. And so my, my ask for, um, for the board, for MCPS, and, and for my colleagues uh, is to be open to looking at some of those details, um, which I have found that I, I, I think we're going to get. And if we don't, I get it, right? But, but I think that we're going to get it. I mean, we're digging into like, OK, HVAC is a thing, right, that's being, uh, that we could fund with ESSER money and we could, you know, those conversations are, we can do the math here, legitimately. Um, and I am actually, again, I'm not entirely sure where we're gonna end up. I would love if the lower number we can get to that's gonna be enough to ensure that our, those, our contracts are funded um, and that the students are not gonna face a negative impact in the classroom, that's gonna help us fund other things that are important and keep taxes low and all of those good things. Um, my concern is that, quite genuinely, uh, when we do the math on those line, I line items, that um, there's not going to be enough couch cushion money. And, but maybe there will be. So my ask for colleagues is that we be willing to include this as our, in our conversations as we move forward to deciding on a final reconciliation package, um, that we are willing to uh, dive into the details the way we have talked about wanting to do so, 
and let's try to come to a, a real number that is based on adding things up. Um, and again, I've seen a willingness from the board and from NCPS to do that. I, I would love to make all that as public as possible and, and so on. Um, but I think that's how, that's how we can say, that's how I can feel comfortable saying that I have made a responsible decision. And, uh, and, I, and I think considering we all want to make sure that those things get funded and we're all expressing that we think that they will, but we don't know, um, my hope is that we can engage in that conversation uh, moving forward. Because again, um, looking at the numbers, I, I'm very concerned, but I know that we all are, and so that's, that's where I am. Very good. Well, your uh, withdrawal of the second is noted so that there are no motions on the table, but I think the point that you raise about um, further engaging in conversation, uh, that is what I'm hearing from everyone, uh, particularly the chair of the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, so there will be an ongoing conversation. And I'll remind colleagues of a memo I wrote uh, back in January when this council officially started, uh, unofficially started, and basically saying use our committees more as a place for oversight, as a place for ongoing conversation, as an ongoing place for budget review. We should not be looking at departments and agencies' budget once a year and making snapshot decisions. This should be an ongoing dialogue. And if there's anything that, if there's one word that has been uttered more today in this council chamber, it is conversation. We need more conversations with the county executive. We need more conversations with our leaders in MCPS. And there is agreement on that. And so with that, there is an ENC committee recommendation for seven items on the high priority and two on priority. All those in favor of the ENC recommendation. And that is unanimous. Thank you all for the very thoughtful and important conversation. And with that, we're in recess till this afternoon.